welcome to the NWO Sports Podcast. Here's your host, Logan Bailey. Welcome to the NWO Sports Podcast, football edition brought to you by a primary sponsor, BSN Sports. I'm your host, Logan Bailey, and joined today by Keith Brown, AJ Fairchild, and Tony Fairchild. So guys, thanks again for joining me. Absolutely. Yes. Always. Good to talk football. Always, Always good, good to talk thing. football. Especially in week six. Week six, <laughs> yeah. yes. Now it's getting more like fall weather, too. The Perfect. rain, getting a little cooler <laughs> it out. Is. It's not yep. 90 degrees and everybody's sweating to death. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Well, it was still pretty hot and humid on Friday in the it press was. box. Yeah, I, I said the, the number one thing was a vet move. I brought that box fan. Right. At least get some kind of air movement yes. in there because it was so hot and yep. humid. And yep. that's the worst part about the rain is the humidity that follows. So AG, AG didn't see much of the game. He was looking behind the fall glass. Oh yeah. <laughs> rain between the glass panes. I couldn't see anything. I was watching it through the our own live stream. <laughs> watching on the monitor. Yep. Uh, but yeah. Anyways, I I. Actually had a heck of a time trying to put the script together for this, as I told you guys. I went on a fishing trip up in Michigan for the salmon run and only caught one salmon the whole time we were there. So it was a rough, long trip, but, hey, it was on the board with one. But uh, it was gorgeous there, and uh, that's where I was the last couple of days. That's why i come kind of been slacking on some content here lately. But, uh, nonetheless, we'll be back on track next week with some things. So Got to get a break, Logan. Yeah, Gotta get yeah. Away. <laughs> yeah, but I, th- I think it's we're turning into an annual thing of of going. And uh, awesome. You know, I did I did some looking, and I was like, I'm curious what the going rate of a salmon is per pound. And so we caught some that were between 17 and probably 24 pounds on the Holy big smokes. on the bigger side of things. They're big fish, mm. and uh, I looked up on Walmart, and I think it's going ten ten dollars a pound. So Ooh, you figure, wow. even if we get half the fish. So say ten pounds worth of fish. I mean that's a hundred dollars worth of salmon right there. Wow! So, but uh, yeah, we, we we came out with a, a good handful and back on track. So <laughs> I was rough staying up yeah. late nights, early mornings, and not running on much sleep. So, uh, but we'll awesome. get we'll get things going here and let's kick things off with how we did for last week's picks. And you guys will never guess who was red hot last week, and that was Tony. Tony went. 17 and three, which is probably one of the better weeks throughout the year. <laughs> yeah. That helped him tighten the gap on the year. Second was AJ with a 16 and four record. Third was Logan with a 15 and five record. Tied for fourth was Keith and Matthew with 14 and six records. And again, just a job well done by Tony. So I'll give you the spotlight to talk about your game picks from last week. What, uh, what led you to picking so well? Nothing. <laughs> Where's the wisdom nothing. there? No, I just, I, you know, I went with Hicksville over Antwerp and, uh, that one paid off and I, North Central would come out with a come out with a win, and they did. So, um, yeah, that Hicksville that Antwerp game, I literally said I would not be surprised if Hicksville won that, yep, and, yep. and sure enough, they did. They came out and they won fifteen to twelve. So, uh, I, I was expecting something uh, creative from you. You know, no, I don't no, know no, if you had anything creative. brewing of uh, no, what no, led to your success. No, no, cre- no creative. Hey, fair enough. I was just nothing. Being literally honest, throwing darts at a wall. <laughs> Sometimes it's like that, though. But uh, on the year, Logan and Matthew are tied for first with records of 77 and 19, good for 80%. Tied for third is Keith and AJ now with records of 75 and 21, good for 78%. And last is Tony, uh, but much closer to the pack with a 73 and 23 record, good for 76%. So the field is definitely tightening. And who knows, if Tony has another good week, I don't know, maybe he could bump up to first Just or second at, so the picks for this week though there's not a whole lot of difference i don't think so yeah. i don't think i'm gonna tighten up too much <laughs> i don't know unless you go against the grain against yeah, all the I, picks which might, you, you've been known to do that before too so yeah, i think I this, throw is, one off this is the lowest i've ever been this late in the season is ranked third yeah <laughs> have to step it up <laughs> so I, we're still all doing very well so tony's the lowest of 76 percent and we have guys picking in the 80 percent upper 70s i'd say that's that's pretty darn good yeah. so all right well with things being a little bit more condensed this week because we had to get a podcast out on short short time frame, uh, we're going to highlight just a few of the top games that were kind of closer. Uh, sometimes it's not always the best to highlight big blowout games because there's really not much to talk about. Because Which a lot of them were this week. Yeah, so. a lot of them were. <laughs> yeah. so. But uh, we'll get things going, and we're going to kick things off with the NWO Sports Game of the Week, and this is why this one was selected as Game of the Week, folks, and it was Fairview at Tenora. Tenora ended up winning this one 35-34. to this game ended up being a walk-off in the final minute thanks to an Owen Farrell to Dominic Graziani hookup for a passing touchdown on fourth down with under, I believe, a minute to go. I said personally this is one of the best games I've seen in the last few years regarding high school football. A packed stadium, it had standing room only. It's a rivalry game. There's a lot of tension in this game. And it was one of the prime matchups in the Green Meadows Conference that we had anticipated since the beginning of the season. So 
this game definitely lived up to the hype. Uh, glad we were just there to witness it, and we, we had this game on call as well on Tenora Rams Live. But uh, Fairview, they jumped out to a 21 nothing lead with 9.04 to go in the second quarter, and things were not looking good for the Rams. And I know we were kind of looking at each other. Man, they're really digging themselves a deep hole. And yeah. Fairview was firing on all cylinders on offense and defense, and Z Dyke was making – tremendous throws downfield big bombs there was a couple blown coverages by Tenor's defense and the defensive backs but nonetheless Z Dyke was really showing off that cannon and why he's one of the top quarterbacks in Northwest Ohio yep. so uh, looking at some other stats from this game halftime score Fairview was up 28 to 7 so 21 point lead going into half total offense Fairview had 509 yards 522 passing the key stat here was they had negative 13 rushing which kind of hurt Fairview down the stretch and we'll discuss this a little bit more later Tenora had 293, 216 passing with 77 rushing. The turnover battle, Tenora had one fumble. Fairview had two interceptions. Some top players, players to note from Tenora. Quarterback Owen Farrell, again, just a sophomore, but he's really doing well in just his second start of the season and his career at quarterback. He was 22 of 33, 67%, 218 passing yards with two passing touchdowns. Very efficient. He handled the ball well. No turnovers. You can't ask for much more out of a young quarterback. Wide receiver, Dylan Shively, five receptions, 84 receiving yards. Uh, even though he didn't score, he was a huge contributor, and every time Farrell would scramble, he'd find yep. him across the middle, and uh, he was there for the clutch reception. Dominic Graziani, six receptions, 24 receiving yards, one receiving touchdown. He had 10 carries, good for 44 rushing yards, and running back Cooper Rapogel, two rushing touchdowns from Fairview. Quarterback Will Zedike, 23 of 38, good for 61%. 522 passing yards, five passing touchdowns. He had two interceptions. And we had talked to, you look at the two interceptions, one hit his receiver in the hands was tipped, and really that wasn't Zedike's fault. And the second one was at the end of the game when there was desperation trying to throw up a Hail Mary. So really, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it counts as interceptions against him, but really it wasn't. Wide receiver Brody Williams, six receptions, 112 receiving yards, three receiving touchdowns, had himself a game. Wide receiver Jonathan Huffman contributed three receptions, 123 receiving yards. So, guys, we were all at this game. It was Like I said, one of the best games that I have seen in the last few years. Great crowd. Uh, You couldn't ask for much more. What are your guys' initial thoughts on this game? Uh, I mean, as you said, you know, talking about the first half, second half, I mean, it truly was a tale of two halves. Um, You know, talked to Coach Becker after the game, and he said he really didn't make any adjustments, just go do your job. I was shocked about that. (laughs) Whatever they did or wasn't doing in the first half, they sure did in the second half. So, um but yeah, just you know, just some uh, some miscues I think in Fairview's behalf there in the second half that opened the door for Tenora, and then obviously the the block punt was everything. I mean, to me, um, that know, came late in the fourth quarter with yeah. four four minutes to go, yeah. and, and Tenora was down by fourteen. I believe yeah, down so. by two, down by thirteen actually. Yeah, thirteen. Yeah, that's <laughs> thirteen right. down by thirteen with down two scores, and we're we're sitting there talking that they need a quick score, you know, and boy, the block punt gave them the short field, allows them to score quick, and. Just so they started on what, like the fifteen, something like that. Yeah, 15, 15, 20, 20 yard line somewhere in there. Yeah. So you know, real quick score. Yeah. And yeah it was just, shoot any time off. Yeah, it's crazy. I just, I don't know. I mean, you guys jump in. I just. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Oh, I, I was gonna know. say we could talk about this game for half an hour. Yeah. I mean, really, we could spend most of the podcast on this because, as Logan said, as far as overall high school game <clears> and. If some of the people that did leave at halftime, I feel bad that they didn't stick around to see oh, yeah. this game because this is probably one of the top two or three games that I've seen. Um, actually, me and Coach Fairchild were talking at half. It was 28-7, to seven, yeah. and that's probably one of, if not the best first half performances by a quarterback that I've ever seen. Well, he, we were he we, was on a pace to break records. Yeah, we were yeah. talking, me and Coach Fairchild were talking about, hey, I don't know what the record for passing yards in a game is. Um But we could see it tonight because at the half, he was 12 of 17 for 384 yards at the half. Yeah. So, I mean, he was on pace to throw 700. Yeah, we were, I mean, we were talking about it. It was like, I mean, Radcliffe days, he, you know, he threw for a bunch of yards. But, man, this kid was just lighting us up. I mean, as far as talking about Tenor, just lighting him up. Yeah. It's, it's not like Tenor just came out in the second half and flipped a switch and got right back into the game instantly. No. I mean, they just methodically worked their way into it. It's one of those games that I guess if you're a coach, you say just never give up because you never know what's going to happen. And, and right here's a perfect example because there's so many. Was there a, a play in the second half that turned things around early? 
I mean, you can't really point to one really. play. Really. Things, not really. Really. Things really didn't happen right. until the fourth no. quarter and no. late late in the fourth yeah. quarter. Like even the, the, the touchdown uh, pass from Z Dyke to Williams when they missed the extra point, I thought then even like, boy, it's going to be rough for us to get back in the game. And uh, yeah, we had closed the gap to 21, 20, 28, 21 at that point. Yes. Yep. And they and came right back, back and, and scored. scored. Like, oh, oh. To make it 33, 21 with, um, what was that right? 30, 34, 20, 30, 34, 20, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, yeah, 34, 20, or 30, yeah, yeah 34, 31 with uh, about, about 10, 11 minutes to go in the fourth quarter. Yeah. But yeah, it's they, just when you thought you were closing the gap, right? All of a sudden, you're like, oh, yeah, no. just big play after big play after yeah. big play for Fairview. But as we saw in the end, when Fairview needed to, to run the ball to kind of milk the clock out, the inability and the, the, the give the Rams defense a lot of credit, like they right. stepped up. Yeah. Like they did not allow, I think, what, for everyone with negative yards rushing, correct? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. negative 13. Um, but the Rams defense, just like unsung hero after unsung hero, would step up and make big play. Shoblin, Helmke, uh, or not Helmke, Holmeyer. Um, <laughs> even Dylan Shiley with that one arm interception. Yeah. Yeah, mean, yeah. Absolutely. It was great. But, I mean, that, this game was just one for the ages, like an instant it classic. Was. There's a couple of points I want to make, too, and I believe I heard this from someone. I'll have to see if it's true, but I heard possibly Coach Helton, Casey Helton, gave one heck of a halftime speech, and I could see Casey Casey gets pretty intense, <laughs> yeah. and I believe that would get the kids fired <laughs> yeah. up for sure. So I played with Casey in high school, and I could see him get rallying the troops at halftime. Supposedly, that's what I was told. And then the other thing is, Tony, I think you described this win perfect for Tenora. Uh, I believe you said gritty, gritty. on the broadcast, yeah. and it was. I mean, down 21 points at halftime. You really dug yourself a deep hole, and really you don't get back into the game until late in the fourth quarter. I mean, that that's yeah. definition of a gritty win, to come back and persevere against all odds, and and they got the job done. So yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, total yards at the half was 381 because Fairview had minus yards rushing, and Snorri had 165 and a 28-7 lead. So Yeah, and, and we've kind of talked about it. We, didn't, we haven't really talked about it as much this year as maybe in the past, the special teams – how important they are. And it bit Fairview in the butt twice in this game, missing the PAT yep. or having it blocked or forget exactly what happened with it. Was it blocked? Yeah, Alex Holmeyer blocked it. Blocked it. Yeah. So it was blocked. And then having a punt blocked with only four minutes left in the game. I, I mean, two special teams plays that seriously determined the entire outcome of the game, you know, getting the short yards on the punt and then, you know, allowing Jacob Bishop to hit, hit that last little point and to knock it over and go ahead of Fairview rather than tying it and putting it in overtime. Just makes a huge difference to be able to get those points. Yeah, not, thank you, Dad. Just, just sorry, and then you know the extra the extra point. You know, so Tenora goes down and scores for people who weren't there. Tenora goes down and scores <laughs> to you know to take the lead or to tie the game actually at thirty four, and then Tenora gets a false start penalty on the extra point. You're like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? So like, you know, you're like, oh, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot here, and and then. <laughs> Fairview tries to run up to the line of scrimmage, and they got Tenora to move, but the the, the flag was it's actually illegal in high school. Yeah, it's illegal to do that yep. now, and and uh, so they called the flag on Fairview, which they got half the distance to the goal, so we got moved up a couple yards, but um, and and Jake was able to knock that through. So I tell you what, after the Arch Bowl game, you know, you know, and, the, and Coach Dominic calling two timeouts, trying to ice Jacob in that game, and then. You know the fiasco that's happening on the extra point that's really going to win them the game, right? Well, the t- <laughs> the time the the game clock wouldn't stop, so they had to reset that yeah. well, twice. Oh, that. Each team called a timeout. Coach Race called a timeout, and I think Coach oh, that was be- that was before the last play. No, during the extra point, I think too, didn't he? No, I don't remember that. I, I don't, so. I don't before the last play, the, they said it to forty two yeah. seconds. I just can't remember them. They were forty two yeah, seconds. Forty two yeah, seconds. The extra point took about seven minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it seemed like the uh-huh. kick, but. Um, I don't know. Like this is just well, a game for the ages. You know, a player a note too that doesn't really get talked about as much is is Jacob Bishop himself. The ability to flip the field like he does. Yeah. You know, he punts the ball. He averages I think it's like thirty five point five yards a punt, which is in high school is phenomenal. And that's even including some of his shorter punts. I think the Otsego game where he kind of shanked one, and then uh, Archbold he kicked one into the wind that was like fourteen mile an hour wind. Right. Yeah, so yeah. you take those away, he's averaging close to forty yards a kick. 
Yeah. It flips the field and pins well, them deep and makes them chew off time on the clock, right. too. Which we saw that after Tenora scored yep. to take the lead, his kickoff went into the end zone, so right. Fairview had to start right. at the 20. Yeah, so. to take away the, the ability for them yep. to even have a chance at a kickoff return is yeah. fantastic. I mean, I know sitting up in the box, it, I felt a relief a little bit when the ball landed in the end zone. It's like, yep. okay, because that, that's always an unpredictable yeah. fiasco yep. on kickoffs like that. Right. Like, you never know what's going to happen. And to take that from them, now it's like, okay, now you have to go out and draw a play and figure something out right. as opposed to getting lucky on a kick return. Yeah, you mentioned Jacob. You know, you, you talk about, I mean, in the fourth quarter there, Tenora, Tenora stopped Fairview, was able to get the ball back, and then couldn't do anything with it. I mean, ended up on the 20-yard line. I mean, it was they were deep in their own territory, and Bishop kicks, puts the ball around the 35, 40-yard right. line the other side, and then they did that twice in a row, I think. Then Jacob had to kick. And that's what I'm kind of thinking. You know, we're down two scores. Like, Coach Becker, uh, I mean, <laughs> kind of thinking that maybe we got to get moving here. Look at the scoreboard. Still had three timeouts. And he goes ahead and punts it away. Trust, trust Jacob to, to, to flip the field as you spoke. And he flips the field again. And then Fairview, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I had no idea what Fairview was doing there, throwing the ball. And Zedike missed a couple throws. I mean, it happens. But I'm just like, your friend is the scoreboard. I mean, the clock right now, you right. got to get that clock to run down, at least make Tenora burn some timeouts. And yep. right. and they didn't do either. They threw some incomplete passes, which there was one that I thought was, I mean, it was a first down, but it was a little bit underthrown. And I don't remember who he threw to. He threw to, but he slipped and fell, I think, as he yeah. caught it or right before he caught it. It was an incomplete pass. And it, I think uh, it was an Gavin, easy first Gavin, down. Gavin Garza. Yeah, I think yep. it was an easy first down, but slipped and fell down. Yep. So, you know, that play right there could have easily have changed some things. But, you know, just not being able to run the ball or throw some short, high, high percentage pass, just little curl routes, if nothing else, just something to keep the clock moving and make, make you know, Tenora burn some timeouts. But, you know, they weren't able to do that. Then a block punt, and then they when they punted the next time, you know, then Tenora gets the ball back with, you know, two something two minutes on the clock with all three timeouts. And yeah. That's an eternity. You know, now you got your whole field to use. You, yep. you can throw it on the middle. You can throw it to the sideline. I mean, you can do whatever, whatever you want, really. You can even run the ball, which they did. I think they ran the ball once. Um, so it just, to me, just, it was just uh, there at the end. Just so just some miscues in Fairview's part by missing some passes there yep. and, and, you know, maybe not running the ball. I mean, I, to me, I know they ran for negative yards, but I, I'm thinking I, I might just run some quarterback draws and just you know, play the, hey, I've got zero yards kind of thing and yeah. <laughs> and hopefully burn. <laughs> I mean, you run 40 seconds off the clock every time, and yeah. we scored with 30-some seconds on yeah, the clock. So you think about seconds. that. Yeah. 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 There's just one last point, too, I want to make on this game, too, and that goes to Fairview. And we all know Will Zedike and what potential and you know, yeah. his greatness that he, he's starting to show here in his junior year. Uh, and we also know the receiving core Fairview has. But one thing that I thought was really inter interesting was Logan – Olinger and Gavin Mead were pretty much held in check this game. They had a combined seven receptions for 113 receiving yards, zero receiving touchdowns, uh, but it just shows how deep the receiving core oh, is with, with guys like Jonathan Huffman and yeah. Brody Williams stepping up. And and you look at Mead and Olinger, those are two of the top wide receivers in the GMC this yep. year. So to keep them in check, but uh, it just shows the, the huge amount of depth they have at the skill position out, out wide uh, at their wide receiver position, the Apaches do. so 500, 522-yard. Passing yards is just insane considering <laughs> he did not have a very good second half, in right. my opinion. I don't think – definitely didn't have the same as he no, did in the first half. No. But, I mean, you know, he just – you know, I thought he missed throws in the second half that he was making in the first yep, half. I agree. Just I could imagine what his stats would have been. Yep. All right. Well, we'll keep things rolling. Obviously, we could talk about that game all night, but yep. there's a couple other games we want to get to. Uh, only have a handful. Like I said, this is a more con condensed podcast. So we're looking at Delta at Archbold. And if you would have asked anyone, I believe you could call this game an upset with Delta coming into this game uh, undefeated at the time. But uh, Archbold overcame a 17-point deficit to win and ended up winning this game 28-24. to And I, I told these guys, Archbold's becoming the comeback kids. They like that late uh, second-half comeback. This is the second game, I believe, that they've shown that. The first one was Genoa earlier in yeah. the season as well. First week. Oh, did it to Tenora. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. And to Sonora. So this is Sonora. And uh Archbold came back to win in the final minutes with a Kurt Kruger to Broden Pierce Field touchdown to stun, undefeated Delta at the time. And again, this was just a thrilling NWL matchup. Saw Delta control the game early. They jumped out to twenty four fourteen lead. But Archbold responded with two late touchdowns. They scored fourteen unanswered points in the fourth quarter to steal this victory away. And this is 
again, it was an anticipated matchup in the NWL, but, uh, you know, it definitely served to be up to it met expectations of this being a great game. Um, looking at some other stats, turnover battle. Delta had four, two fumbles, two interceptions. Unfortunately, I did not have Archbold statistics. Uh, I had to get a couple of them from uh, online. Looking at uh, some top players from Archbold, quarterback Kurt Kruger was 6 of 9, 129 passing yards, two passing touchdowns. And actually, he came in the second half. He didn't even start the first half. First half went to quarterback Jarrett Rufinacht, had 116 passing yards, 59 rushing yards, one passing touchdown. He had one rushing touchdown, so he started the first half. Wide receiver Broden Piercefield really had a nice game. Three receptions, 34 receiving yards, two receiving touchdowns, including the game winner. Running back Ryder Ryan, he's been tearing things up at the running back position for the Blue Streaks all year long, 112 rushing yards. And then from Delta side of things, running back Landon Littermoot, 181 rushing yards, one rushing touchdown. Uh, quarterback Freeze had uh, 20 passing yards, one pa- rushing touchdown, one passing touchdown, had a couple of interceptions. And wide receiver Flores, 20 receiver receiving yards, one receiving touchdown. So, guys – Thoughts of this game here. Nice. Delta basically had to lead the entire game until the, the last, what, three minutes. So, um, But Coach Dominic, you give him and his boys credit. Like Coach Dominic's been there for a decade. Very well-coached team, wins 60 or 76% of his games. It's one of those games that most people thought Delta would win, um, probably except for the Archibald community. I mean, like, yeah. boy, we got Coach Dominic. You know, we're going to ride his horse and – yeah, your coach Vickers, you're probably one or two first downs away from winning this game, and you know you, you got to just look forward. But uh, tough, tough loss for Delta. But uh, give Archibald credit here. Looking at the numbers, like like Logan said, uh, um, Kruger didn't even start, came back, and this is the third win for Archibald in the in the fourth quarter, yep. late fourth quarter. Yep, so, yep. Um, but yeah, very very quality win for the for the streaks. We had kind of. Kind of thought maybe Delta was going to be looking at maybe the the second team in the NWAL. At least I did. I thought maybe that Delta was going to be the team that had the best chance at going up against Liberty Center, seeing the way they started off the season. But falling to Archbold, that man, that surprises me, and that's uh, going to throw a, sh- a wrench into my yeah. predictions for <laughs> yeah. the NWAL. I don't think at this point anybody's even going to touch Liberty Center. I just I, th- I thought they were the only one that was going to make a dent in their defense, and and seeing that. Liberty Center is going to just roll through the conference. I think opinion. you're going to see Liberty Center and Delta, two two teams of kind of like minded, two like minded teams. Pretty run much the ball, run the run same the ball, offense. Ball, two yeah. teams that are physical, like yeah, to run the ball gonna, downhill. Gonna, yeah, they're just going to line up. And you know, after talking, you know, to about Delta and how they're, you know, they're. I think you know, but you talk about Archbold. I think you know, we mentioned the word gritty for Sonora. I think you know, <laughs> Archbold's kind of proven they're gritty as well, yeah. coming out and digging out some fourth quarter wins. But yeah. you know. Um, you know, I know we talked about Delta having, you know, possibly being in that role against Liberty Center later on. Could be two undefeated teams. Well, not anymore. And now Archbold, you know, they struggled a little bit, you know, at the beginning of the year, and now they've come back and they're putting some wins together. You never know what's going to happen over there. Right. That's something with nice Archbold. Job. They lost a lot to a graduating senior class last year, so. There's a lot say, of 22 kids. I think so, so. so they had a big said, senior yeah. class. So they had a lot, a lot of big shoes to fill this year and a lot of key roles. Uh, you look at, they lost Cade Brenner, their starting quarterback for the last couple of years. And that's always a tough position to fill. Obviously quarterback position on offense pretty yeah. much runs everything. And uh, you know, lost the running back too, and Jack yeah. Hurst. And so I think that the blue streaks are finally getting to that point where things are starting to click. And yeah. I think w- one win leads into another and another and another. And I yeah. think that's just where they're getting at the end of the season. So who knows? I, I, I think early on, everyone knew Liberty center was going to be the, the yep. king and Delta was that second team. And Patrick Henry is kind of in that contention, yep. but I think you got to throw Archbold's hat in the ring to be right up there towards the top two. I think they're proving some big things here in the middle stretch of the season, which is really what, when yep. you want to start be playing your best ball is that middle to late half of the season. So yeah, if you look at like you know just looking ahead, which if you're a coach you don't want to look ahead, but if Archibald wound up with seven wins this season, I don't think anybody would be surprised. Oh yeah, <laughs> with with really a, a team that's probably not as dominant as some of the coach Dominic teams in the last five six seven years yeah, so. and I think that's an interesting thing you look at Archbold and they've got good athletes but I don't necessarily see anyone jump off the page not like, like you look back past. like from like yep. a DJ Newman who yep. was a superstar at Archbold yep. or uh, guys like uh, Chase Miller or Jack yep. Hurst guys right. that were really explosive yep. uh, I see a lot of good 
good athletes, and I see a lot of guys that are playing well together as a team. So I think if they continue to build off that, and I don't think you necessarily need superstars to win games. If you no. have a, you know, all those guys, I guess looking at a team, say the kind of lower end of the athleticism on the team is kind of up a little bit higher. You know, I think that's where Archbold is. I see a lot of guys that are at that good level and uh, they're going out there competing and they're winning ball games, which is you can't ask more out of your players than that. Yep. So and do is fight. Just like you said earlier, Keith, yep. just don't ever give up. Just keep yep. fighting. Yep. Yep. All right, let's move on to the next game. Looking at Hicksville at Antwerp and Hicksville won this game 15 to 12. Like I said earlier, I, I said when I was picking this game last week, it would not surprise me one bit if Hicksville ended up winning this game. Granted, I did hear Antwerp had some injuries. I believe someone said they had like 8 to 12 kids out. They were really kind of struggling with injuries. But looking at some stats, halftime Hicksville had was up 15 to nothing, so jumped out to an early lead. Total offense, Antwerp had 189 yards, 115 passing. Hicksville had 272 yards with 163 rushing. Turnover battle, Hicksville had one fumble. Antwerp had three, one fumble and two interceptions. Some top players from Hicksville running back Cross Seed Ike, a nice game from him. 14 carries, 114 rushing yards, one rushing touchdown. Wide receiver Brant Langham, six receptions, 21 receiving yards. He had one receiving touchdown. Also carried the ball five times for 32 rushing yards. And quarterback Garrett Turnbull, 11 of 20, 91 passing yards, one passing touchdown. From Antwerp's side of things, quarterback Hampton Rogi, 7 of 15, 108 passing yards, one passing touchdown with one interception and one rushing touchdown. Wide receiver Dane Scholl, two receptions, 58 receiving yards, one receiving touchdown, two carries for 18 rushing yards. So, guys, thoughts on this key GMC matchup here? I think uh, a lot of these teams here kind of in the middle of GMC right now, Hicksville, Antwerp, Wayne Trace, Paulding, they're kind of finding themselves all – they're going to be fighting each other hard to, you know, see who's going to be coming up against Tenora. And, and, I mean, Fairview is still in contention. If if one of those teams would knock off Tenora, <coughs> there's a very good chance somebody like Hicksville or Antwerp or somebody like that could – well, I mean, Antwerp might be out of it now, but they could end up sliding up in there and maybe sharing a piece of that title. So they're going to be fighting like crazy here in the middle, and it's going to be interesting to watch these teams. I think it's still kind of all up in the air in the GMC, you know, with yeah. Hicksville. And, um, you know, you got Edgerton and Paulding – you know, all the teams yet, they're still fighting around. They're, they're, like I said, if it, if the person that wins the GMC has one loss, would not surprise me just like it was last year. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened with Antwerp. I don't know if the rain was a problem over there. You know, I know it was raining at Sonora, but I'm not sure. People said it was kind of raining around us, but I, I don't know if it was raining. So, you know, if you're throwing up, if you're a passing attack and it's raining, it always tends to mess with the game. But um, I don't know. It, it, but, uh so, not shocked at all after what we saw against Hicksville when Sonora played them. Not, not shocked at That's all. That's a solid ball club. Yeah, they got some good good athletes over there, so not shocked at all that they came away with a win. Yeah, I got to watch this game when I got home Friday because, number one, after the Tenora win, like I couldn't sleep. Number <laughs> And number two, I have to write my post-game article that I do, so I don't think I went to bed to like 2.33 in the morning, Saturday morning, <laughs> but I got to watch this game on My Sports Live. They do a great job over there, but – um. Hicksville basically controlled the game from start to finish, really. Um, weather really wasn't an issue over there. Um, Derek Hines was hurt, I think, uh, late first quarter, maybe early second for, for Antwerp. But I think Hicksville's offense may have discovered a little bit of something. Even though they lost to Tenora a few weeks ago, I think with their diversity that they used, changing the quarterbacks in and out, using Langham in motion all that time. Yeah, and, they use a lot uh, of motion, a lot I, of misdirection. Yeah, it's, they, it's hard to follow. I think they discovered some some things that may not work all the time, but uh, they're just deceptive on offense because they got, as you said, Logan, they just have somebody moving at all times. So your defense has to constantly uh, adjust. Yeah, but, I think the big thing, too, with Hicksville is they – from watching them when they played Tenora, it's not that they run all this fancy stuff. No. I mean, they just window dress yeah. it. They, yep. you know, they run it, yep. disguise it with different motions right. and different formations, mm -hmm. and they do a really good job at it. And I think that's the thing. A lot of times is you see a lot of teams around the area. Their offense, they try to run five million plays, and right. Right. If you can run a set of plays and you can window dress it like that out of different formations, disguise it with some motions, things like that, and just be really good at those. Right. I think a lot of teams have a lot of success, and I think that's what the Hicksville Aces are doing right now. And I think the first play that they ran was uh, they handed off to, to, to Brant Langham, and he threw about a 45-yard pass down to the Antwerp maybe 10-yard <laughs> line. So the Langham first, did? I, yeah. I thought I saw you yes. had a, yep. a passing had a, attempt. He or, sure did. So. But, yeah, good game by Cross Z Dyke. Uh, Hicksville defense, again, stepped up, played played fantastic. But, yeah, this was a fun game to watch. Um, but, yeah, Hicksville basically controlled the whole game. 
All right, let's move on to the next game. Looking at Whiteford, Michigan at Eden, and this was a big anticipated matchup as well. These two teams have kind of went at it the last couple of years. Whiteford won this one big last year, I believe, by like 30-plus points. So Eden was out for revenge. Eden ended up winning this one 50-20. to 20. And I was telling these guys, too, Whiteford is just one year removed of going 13-1. and one. Yeah. Last season, I believe they made it either to their state semifinal or the championship game. And Whiteford has historically had a very good – football program and the smaller divisions of uh, Michigan football. So a uh, huge win out of Eden and looking at some total yards, Eden had 481, 403 passing. Unfortunately, I didn't have any for Whiteford turnovers. Eden had zero key stat Whiteford. I believe had just one with an interception, some top players from Eden guys. This is going to pop off the page here, but quarterback Kyler sap 33 of 47, 70%, 403 passing yards, six passing touchdowns, 31 carries, 74 rushing yards, one rushing touchdown. That man did it all that game. <laughs> did it all. Literally. Oh, did it <laughs> all. Jeez. I, that was something. When I went through and was reading the box score and seeing how that game ended up, and I'm just like, Kyler Sapp, the man over there for the Bombers this year. I mean, he's been tearing things up, and it's like week after week we keep seeing his name, but Eden is doing some big things this year, and they are just tearing things up, still undefeated, and uh, – a lot of it is, you know, Kyler Sapp and his receiving core, and uh, they've got some really good athletes over there and kind of leading into some of the other top players. But wide receiver Kendall Briggle, he's had himself a huge year as well. Yes. 11 receptions, 108 receiving yards, one receiving touchdown. Uh, wide receiver Max Radabaugh, five receptions, 154 receiving yards, two receiving touchdowns. Uh, wide receiver Cohen Hulbert, seven receptions, 39 receiving yards with three receiving touchdowns. So, guys, thoughts on the Whiteford, Michigan at Eden game? I, I just want to know how many total plays they played on offense. You're, looking at, I mean, you're looking at 64 plays that they ran on offense. That's got to be darn near all well, of them. Well, I was, I was doing the same thing. Like, I sat through 47 times and he ran the ball 31 times. Oh, That's. Yeah. 70, yeah, sorry, 78 plays, plays 78 Tyler plays, Sapp yeah. had the ball in his Yeah, hands. sorry. I was just taking his completions. Yeah, 78 plays. So. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, 13 carries. Okay. I had to double-check that. I was looking at that. I'm like, 31 oh, carries. Still thir- 60. Oh. The typo. 13, <laughs> okay. not 31, but still. 60, 60 plays. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's still 60 plays. Yeah. I mean, go, uh, go ahead. I, I didn't know. I just uh, that was that was a stat. I was gonna say thirty one carries, even thirty. I know. I got to 60s. I got to look at that. Thirty one carries. I'm like, that's a lot for a running back, right. let alone a quarterback. Even, to be running even that, six, so. even sixty plays. He, you know, he was. I was just curious how many total plays they had because he had to be involved in every single one of them, obviously. But um, no, just tearing it up and, and to knock off Whiteford is a big win for them, and um, it just it's just a big win for Eden. Yeah, I don't even. We were talking. Next big test for Eden. It's got to be probably out of it. Out of it. Yeah, I don't, I look at their schedule. That'd, that'd be for a conference title. Yeah. So, I mean, other than that, I think Eden's going to sweep a lot of teams, I think. So, I was just thinking about what AJ said about Liberty Center. I was just looking at Eden's schedule. Yeah, they don't. They don't really play much until they get to Ottawa Hills, so they could have a running clock right. in every game as well. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I just like to see, like, their average numbers for offense, like passing yards and – points per game and whatnot. But, I mean, your defense is obviously pretty darn yeah. good as well. Defense is very <laughs> stout. So, you know, that was that was a thing yeah, lacking in, in, the, in the past, you know, with Coach Owen. You, you got a shootout on your hand. It's going to be 47 to, to, to 42, but, you know, you allow 20 points here to a very good Whiteford team, 50 to 20. That's very impressive. And, like I said, these, these kids are going to rewrite some of the season, single-season record books on, on Eden this year. I, I would think Sapp's got to be on pace – I mean, I know Drew Gallahue a couple of yep. years ago, and now Drew is down at a Ohio Dominican start, yeah. starting quarterback there in Division Two. But uh, he had a lot of records. I think Kyler Sapp's got to be close. To, I would oh, think to approaching. Be. I mean, he started the last yep. couple of years, so he's got to be right on the heels of a lot of those records. Like you said, like Gannon Ripke set some receiving records a yeah. couple of years ago, but Kendall Briggle's got to be sniffing some of those as well. I would think so. I mean, it's and we're talking not only school records, state records. Oh, too. absolutely, so yes. That's yes. a that's the thing of a Bob Olin offense is you're going to rewrite the books pretty yep. much every season if you have some really good athletes. Yeah. To just some quick math, Eden's outscoring our opponents two hundred and thirty to sixty seven. Wow, wow, pretty wow. solid. Yeah, yeah they've given they gave up twenty six to Edgerton and twenty uh, against Whiteford. It's about forty. Games are, Antwerp that? was six. They gave up eight to Hicksville and uh, seven to Margaret. And then twenty points to Edgerton at one point, I believe. Until this week, Edgerton was leading. I think what are they, Division Seven? Yes, they were one of the top teams top in scoring average for Division Seven. Wow. So, yeah, pretty impressive. Yeah, 
All right, let's move on to the last game re- recap here. We're going back to the GMC. Another close matchup, kind of an upset, I think, if you ask us. But this was Edgerton at Wayne Trace. Wayne Trace came away at this one 20 to nothing. At halftime, uh, it was the score was 0-0, to zero, so this ball game was decided in the second half. Total yards, Edgerton had 135, 94 passing. Wayne Trace had 364, 242 rushing. Turnovers, Edgerton had two interceptions. Wayne Trace had two interceptions. Looking at some top players from Wayne Trace, quarterback Jack Schuenauer was 12 of 22, 122 passing yards with two passing touchdowns and two interceptions. That's a lot of twos in that stat line. (laughs) (laughs) Running back Lance Whitman, 11 carries, 58 rushing yards, two rushing touchdowns. Nice performance out of him. And then from Edgerton, top player, linebacker Joel Walkup had him listed down for 24 tackles and one tackle for loss. So one of the better linebackers in the Green Meadows Conference and area, still tearing things up on the defensive side of things. So, guys, thoughts of the Edgerton at Wayne Trace game. <laughs> Let AJ start this. Uh, AJ's got this one. <laughs> just Wayne Trace and the turnovers. Not just them, but whoever they're playing also. Two turnovers on both sides of the ball. What I just don't understand. Did they put Vaseline on the football over there? <laughs> they're, who, they whenever do. somebody walks into Wayne Trace, it seems like there's always four, six, you know, some, oh, yes. somewhere in that neighborhood <laughs> yeah. of turnovers. and. It should make every team nervous for whatever yeah. reason. There's a curse over Absolutely. there. Absolutely. So I tell you, when Sonora goes to Wayne Trace, I'm going to be crossing, you know, <laughs> oh, two oh weeks. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Here we go. You know, just they always have – I don't know what it is about that place, but you look at the stat lines every week, and if they're at Wayne Trace, there's always turnovers. Maybe it's the maybe it's the windmills over there blowing the ball around. <laughs> the, red, the red flashing lights that are all yeah, over, right? Messing with everybody. I'll give Coach Holden and his defense credit because Edgerton, as Logan said, coming into this game, we're in the top 10 of the state, I think, as far as points scored and offensive yards per game, I believe. And to to score none yeah. against Wayne Trace, who uh, was under 500 going in, but a heck of a game plan by the Raiders and Coach and Holden not, over there. You know, a big, big shutout. Yeah, yeah, huge shutout. And I'm not sure that what exactly happened, but I saw – Maddox Baker, I don't know if he got injured or because um, I saw Edgerton's backup quarterback came in and uh, take a few snaps and was in the box score as well. So not sure, you know, if an injury happened and yeah. he's a huge component to that offense. And yeah. I heard some rumors about maybe some other injuries over at Edgerton, which could have played played into right, it. Absolutely. But but still to win pretty win. handedly twenty to nothing and take control of the entire second half. That's yeah. that's impressive. I think you can't take anything away from the Raiders, but like I've been saying every single week, you have to bring your best ball in the Green Meadows Conference. We saw yeah. that against Fairview Tenora. We saw that against Edgerton Wayne Trace, Hicksville Antwerp. It's 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 anyone's game every single night. So, the moment that you can you become complacent in the conference schedule, you're going to lose, no yeah. doubt about it. So, uh, you got to bring your A game every single night. Yeah, this Absolutely. game like basically threw a monkey wrench in the entire GMC standings. You got Tenora Paulding. Atop the standings at two and zero, then you got Edgerton, Fairview, Hicksville, Wayne Trace, all now at one and one. Antwerp and Earsville are zero and two, but yeah, this was. I don't really don't think too many people predicted uh, Wayne Trace was going to shut out Edgerton, let alone beat them. So right, yeah. then another uh, highlight that I think Logan pointed out, but like every week we see Joel Walkup, twenty four tackles. <laughs> I mean that's just a lot. that's just insane. It's yeah, a lot. Twenty four tackles. I mean, He's I can obviously see in the field very, very well yeah. from his position. I consider. What do you What do you guys think? I'll let you guys say this, but I think in high school football, ten tackles or more, that's a pretty good amount for high yeah. school. Yeah, if you so ten so, to fifteen, you did you got a really good night. Yeah, tw- twenty plus. That's a whole other <laughs> level. So yeah. must have been running all over the field. Yeah, I mean, at some so. point, you would think that. They would be running away from him and trying to take him out right. of the play. Yeah. Obviously, so, he's in the middle. Yeah, I would guess. He's they be just Mike couldn't Linebacker get away from just, him at all. Yeah, he's got to be the Mike, and they're just spying. He's just going with the ball. They've got him freed up something. The, the, the setup has has to have him free to free, roam. Yeah. He's he's going where the ball goes, and and obviously he's not getting fooled much. <laughs> no, no, not with twenty four <laughs> tackles. Yeah, you're not. you're not you're not fooling him much with uh, this he, direction. He's, he's not he's just seeing a, the ball. A brute. He's he's got to be intelligent too yeah. to be able to see the ball and move with it. But, yeah, nice game with with him. All right. Well, that concludes our game recaps. We're going to take a break to hear from our sponsors. We'll be right back. DSN Sports is your go-to business for purchasing uniforms, equipment, spirit wear, and anything else your athletic program needs, giving you more time to impact lives on the field. With over 1,200 sales professionals who live, work, and serve in your community, you're always just a short drive or phone call away. Be sure to give your local sales rep and Jim Garris a call for any of your athletic supply needs. Optimal Performance Fitness is your go-to gym in Northwest Ohio, providing group fitness classes, personal training, and sports performance sessions for area athletes. Located in Napoleon, Ohio, give them a call today at 419-438-7265. 
McBadden Stevens Body Shop is your number one voted auto body shop in Northwest Ohio. We are your experts on all makes and models and are the only Chrysler, Ford, and GM certified collision repair center in the area. Located in Jewel, Ohio, give us a call today at 419-497-3111 to schedule your free estimate. Come check out the Bad and Stevens Body Shop difference. We're back on the NWO Sports Podcast, and we are on to play of the week. And again, many great plays were sent in. And like I said last week, we're going to continue to mention these. Uh, we'll feature some of the honorable mention selections. So here they are. Snap, scoops it up. What? What? Picked up by Alex Holmeyer at the 30, 25, 20. Oh! Out of bounds inside the Fairview 20. A low snap. Almost blocked. As I always say, there can only be one. So, play of the week this week is going to go to none other than the Tenor Rams and a passing touchdown from quarterback Owen Farrell to Dominic Graziani. We'll have one timeout left, too. Correct. Rams break the huddle from the sideline. Same formation. This is on the offensive line. If they can give Farrell time, Rams will score here. Four receivers near side, one far side empty backfield. Farrell, fourth and goal from the seven. Straight back drop. He's got all day to throw. Throws it over the middle. Go! Touchdown! Touchdown! Dominic Graziani finds the game at the Oh, floor. yeah! Oh, yeah. Looked and looked and looked and looked, and looked. Are you kidding me? There's like four or five guys all Wow. Oh, my gosh. That was a ice, ice in Owen Farrell's veins. <laughs> that was a wow. Ball. Rams with an extra point. It was fourth down. And this tied up the game with less than a minute to go in the fourth quarter and would end up being uh, the winning uh, extra point made uh, thanks to Jacob Bishop extra point. So, guys, we were all there for this game. How ice in his veins, Owen Farrell, like I said during the broadcast, on fourth down, it's it's you win or you go home right here, right now, I believe, on the, what, 10-yard line or right around there. Right around there. Yeah. And uh, came up with a huge touchdown pass and Dominic Graziani finishing it off in the end zone. So, guys, what were your thoughts on this play of the week? Ice in his veins for a sophomore that's only had two starts. Like, that's that's what's incredible about it. He's uh, coming out after they switch things up on that offense and, and is performing as, be- as best as anybody could expect. Uh, you know, winning a game like this on a play like this yeah, is absolutely. incredible. I, I just, uh, you know, Dominic coming across. You know, they drew that play up. That was a play they had drawn up. They had Dominic lined up all the way to the left, yep. far outside guy, and had him come across and across the middle. And for Farrell to just sit – I mean, it, it probably happened in, you know, a second, but it had to seem like an eternity waiting for him to get across, you know, where, yeah. where he, and then he, he just came open right in the middle. And I mean, and Farrell threw a strike. I mean, it just an awesome and, play. And the line held up really well, yeah, too, because I think he probably had, I would say, close to almost four seconds. Oh, yeah, in the saying, I mean, it, it was like, <laughs> it was a good four seconds. And, and that's a pretty, pretty long amount of time to sit yeah. back there, just very poised, keeping his eyes, scanning the field and, yeah. Waiting for Graziani to come across, especially since Tenora's offensive line has been kind of rocky a little bit for the first couple of games. They're they're starting to find a groove now too. The, yep. the whole offense is looking a lot better in the last two weeks here. They had a lot of pressure on Owen, and um, like you said, give him credit. Stepped up, packed house. Um, basically, if you lose this game, your GMC title hopes possibly you're out the window. And like you said it had all day. Kudos to the Rams offensive line and Dominic Graziani. Another good game for him. You know, at, at the running back position, although he wind up as a receiver on this one, but hit him 
right in the number five yep. coming across the middle. You couldn't have drew it up any better. So, yeah, this is, this is a great play to, to win the game. Yeah, I mean, you, you compare this to the game against Antwerp last year. Airso. Where, you know, where they, where they came up a little bit short. You know, oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. And, yeah, that you one, know, yep. yeah, when Sonora came up a little bit short and, and didn't finish the game out, this one they did. Yep. So uh, just yeah. just a kudos to them for uh, siding play. Oh, yeah, oh. It reminds me a lot of the Arizona game last year when oh. they came up with it in the last 30 oh, seconds yeah. or so, last minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah well-deserved, no doubt. Yep. But yeah, again, play of the week is going to go to Owen Farrell, connection to Dominic Graziani uh, to end up leading to the win of the Brams over the Apaches. It was a huge hookup and ended up winning them the game. So congratulations to the Tenor Rams for that play of the week. We're going to move on to player of the week from week five. And again, keeping things condensed just because I didn't have a lot of time over the last week to put things together. One kid stuck out more than any of the others. And this kid is going to get player of the week brought to you by BSN sports. That's none other than Eden quarterback, Kyler Sapp. When you go 33 or 47, 70%, 403 passing yards. He had seven total touchdowns. Uh, that's just, it's a no doubter, no brainer. You got to go with Kyler Sapp, especially against a quality team like Whiteford, yep. Michigan. And I know, I, I believe Whiteford's sitting at two and two now, but still a quality team. Yep. If you, the team went 13 and one the year before, right. you're still going to have a quality program, quality coaching really good athletes, and Eden took care of business thanks to his performance. And, guys, uh, what are your thoughts on Kyler Sapp, BSN Sports Player of the Week? Don't yeah. think there's much really to say about it. I mean, <laughs> the stats speak for themselves. <laughs> putting up those kind of numbers, it's hard to go against putting him up as Player of the Week. Yeah, yeah I think that really the only other option would have been William Zedike had they won. Yeah, right. I mean, oh, that, yeah. Was, that was really the only one that would have been close to the two. Well, you figure, too, Sapp, if, if Fairview I mean, probably would have won, and the one interception was tipped, but the other one he wouldn't have, and he could have possibly gone if things were still going Fairview's way. He could have easily threw for six, seven hundred yards. Oh, he would, and oh easily five, he'd six, have been over six, six for sure. sure. Yeah, he'd have been over six for sure. That was just insane. We knew, we read off the stats for William Zedike there at the, at the game. It was just you, you, we knew he was doing well, but then you start looking at the stat, you're like, holy crap. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, uh, Zedike is definitely worth mentioning in there. But uh, you know, had he come up with a win, well, then I, then I think that it might have been different, but. Yep, congratulations to Kyler. Fantastic yep. yeah, game, definitely. fantastic year. So, again, Player of the Week will receive NW Sports gear courtesy of BSN Sports, and thank you to sales rep Jim Jim Garris and Rob Held for being great supporters of coverage for athletics in Northwest Ohio. So thanks again to BSN Sports. Uh, they've done a lot to help us out and uh, help provide coverage and uh, give these kids recognition. So, mm -hmm. All right, we're going to move on to the power rankings for Week 6. And, again, like I always do, I'll read them off, and these guys will roast me, and we'll see how things go. So we're going to start off with number 26. We're looking at Swanton, 25 North Central, 24 Ayersville, 23 Hilltop, 22 Montpelier, 21 Bryan. We'll save the top 20. Pretty accurate. Yeah. yeah. I think the big thing now, you start getting into the second half of the season, we're already in week six, is things start to sort themselves out. So yeah. I think things get a little bit easier here down the stretch. There's still some some questions here, and we'll see in the top 20, so things will get a little tricky there. So com coming in at number 20, looking at Antwerp, 19 Edgerton, 18 Wayne Trace, 17 Hicksville, 16 Evergreen. We'll save the top 15. Again, I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, I would say accurate. Yep. Coming in at number 15, Wasion, number 14, Lipsick, 13, Van Wert, 12, Fairview, 11, Tenora, 10, Ottawa, Glandorf. Very good. Tenora on the rise, I think, but yeah, that uh, looks good. And yeah. Continuing yeah. on with the top 10, so 10 was Ottawa, Glandorf, 9, Archbold, 8, Paulding, 7, Patrick Henry, 6, Delta. I think this, some of uh, these get kind of yeah, tough. I, I don't know. I, I don't know that... I mean, I'm like, oh, we're supposed to be ahead of Delta because they beat him. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I I think it's fine. Yeah, um, looks I like actually it. know if Paulding falls at number eight. I guess we'll find out here in the next week or two. But, uh, yep. yeah, like you said, it's going to sort itself out. And in a lot of these games right now, it's a lot of these rankings, it's hard to say yes or no that we agree with it because they're kind of still undecided, really. I mean, we haven't really seen a lot of these uh, matchups to see where they, they play off at yet, so. I think the th the big question for me is Ottawa Glandorf. They sit at two and three right now. Uh, they're coming off a tough loss to St. Mary's, where St. Mary's is a pretty yep. quality team in the WBL. And all these teams that they play are so much bigger than a lot of these right. other schools. That's yeah. that's it gets kind of tricky mm -hmm. when you start comparing WBL to GMC. So yep. I'm still not sure where they fit at. Uh, you can kind of look at some comparisons. I think it'll be interesting when Van Wert and Ottawa Glandorf play each other because that will right. kind of sort some things out. But this weekend. 
Uh, yeah, just actually this week. This, this week. So, uh, or wait, let me see. Is this week? Uh, next week. Next week. Van Wert plays St. Mary's this week, and Ottawa Glandorf plays Lima Bath. So ne- Bath. next week we'll Lima we'll Bath. figure that out. So, breaking the top five team that's really climbed the ranks is Eden, four Defiance, oh. three Napoleon, two Columbus Grove, and one none other than Liberty Center. So, guys, thoughts on the top five? I I think they're sitting pretty accurate. I, mean, I think Eden deserves being the top five. I mean, yeah. They're five and zero. Oh, I think they deserve to be in there. People could make the argument for Paulding as well, and you put Paulding and Eden against each other. Who would win? I, I don't know. Eden's beat three other GMC teams. Yeah, <laughs> it sure have. Yeah. So, yeah. including Edgerton. <laughs> yeah, including so. Edgerton. So yeah, I think the top two are certainly solidified yeah, yeah, with Liberty Center and Columbus Grove, and they're expected to win out the rest of the season big. Yeah, they're taking, they, out, they're they, taking care of business. They've handled all their opponents, and surprisingly, Columbus Grove hasn't really missed a beat since losing Landon uh, Best. No. I believe, uh, I can't remember what his name is. I believe it's Sauter that came in to uh, play quarterback for Landon Best, and I saw some highlights from <clears> that game, and I think he might have thrown maybe one interception or so, but he's, he's doing a very nice job at fill, for filling in a role that really, you know, wasn't expected to be playing this year with a quarterback like right. Best, who was right. third team all Ohio as a sophomore. Right, right. So, yep. uh, excellent job out of him and the Bulldogs. And Liberty Center just keeps on rolling, and <laughs> it's it's just another machine over there. And yep. little old LC, but uh, <laughs> everyone and their brother again. Uh, they've they've got so much support over there. Same with Columbus Grove. It's yep. just amazing to see those two communities and continue to go back. And it keeps getting brought up over and over that these two teams need to play a con- non-conference <laughs> battle each year. I would love to see that, especially with the venues. Yep. Probably probably the top two stadiums in Northwest Ohio, one on grass, mm-hmm. one on turf. But yep. with the lights, the atmosphere, the stadium, the community, you can't beat that in Northwest Ohio. That's so, right. But, uh, yeah, that, that concludes our power rankings. So things continue to sort themselves out. And uh, I think the top five are pretty solid. Uh, even even top 10, there's, so, there's still some questions there towards the end, but uh, we'll see how things play out in the next couple of weeks. All right, we're going to move on to Matthew's players of the week. And on offense, Matthew has Eden quarterback Kyler Sapp, just won our NW Sports player of the week. So uh, reasoning is Montpelier has really struggled on defense this season so far. And I think Sapp will take advantage of their struggles and have a big night. So on the defensive side of things, Cam Colley from LC, reasoning is Brian has really struggled on offense and has struggled to put points on the board this season, so I think Colley will disrupt their passing and run game. So good analysis from Matthew and Cam Colley. Again, one of the top defensive backs around Northwest Ohio. He's just tearing things up as a menace, and Kyler Sapp is doing his thing on the offensive side of the ball, slinging the rock, and going to probably be setting records, to be honest. So, again, Make sure you follow those players because uh, Matthew, he, he's, uh, he's a predictor of always some of the better performances in the area. Nostradamus. Nostradamus. <laughs> Bring him to Vegas with you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a break to hear from our sponsors. We'll be back with everyone's favorite segment, The Hot Takes, presented by VSN Sports. Marco's Pizza is honored to sponsor NWO Sports, serving your pizza of choice in Northwest Ohio. Defiance, Archbold, Wauseon, Delta, Brian, Napoleon, Paulding, and Montpelier. Order online at marcos.com today. Remax Realty of Defiance has represented Defiance County for nearly 40 years. Located at 1401 South Jefferson Avenue in Defiance, we have 13 agents ready and available to assist you in home buying or selling needs. You can check out all the listings at www.remax419.com or call us at 419-784-3029. Let our years of experience go to work for you. For 26 years, Burkholder Taxidermy has been Northwest Ohio's trusted full-service taxidermist. From game heads to lifelike mounts, we provide exceptional quality and craftsmanship. Preserve your memories with Burkholder Taxidermy, where experience meets excellence. Located at 19331 Buckskin Road, Defiance, Ohio. Give them a call at 419-782-9538. Fairchild Family Chiropractic aims to help families to get better together in the least invasive way possible. Dr. Fairchild focuses on the neck using the Blair Technique and Palmer Package adjusting to correct spinal misalignments. Located in Defiance, Ohio, call Dr. Fairchild today at 419-576-5070 to schedule an appointment. DeLarber Concrete and Hauling is your go-to provider for concrete and hauling needs. Flat work, pole barn floors, driveways, and patios. Hauling services for stone, mulch, and dirt. Call Josh for your free estimate at 419-576-0401. 
Jim and his basketball academy strives to create an atmosphere to cultivate basketball fundamentals in Northwest Ohio youth athletes, offering one-on-one sessions, group sessions, speed and agility training, and much more. Located in Pettisville, Ohio, call Coach Jesse today at 419-551-8105. Check out Tenora Rams Live. Live events broadcast on YouTube and post-game results, articles, schedules, and more can all be found on TenoraRams.com. Feel free to look up their Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram pages as well. Northwest Ohio Basketball hosts premier basketball tournaments for boys in grades 3 to 8 in the area. Upcoming tournaments are right around the corner. Give them a call today at 419-283-5296 or check out their website at nwobball.com. The Drop Zone Pizzeria is the number one voted pizza restaurant in the region. Check them out for pizza, wings, subs, and more. Located in Ayersville and Stryker or ask them about their traveling food trailer. True Land Equipment and Sales and Lauren Brown are your go-to for John Deere Equipment in Archbold, Ohio. Mowers, combat tractors, skid loaders, and more. Your sales expert on commercial turf and CCE sales. Give Lauren a call today at 419-445-1565. We're back on the NW Sports Podcast, and we are on to the hot takes presented by BSN Sports. So we got a handful of good ones, and uh, actually not a handful, a lot of good ones this week. Yeah. So we're going to get things kicked off, and – I have a lot of good discussions here tonight. So the first hot take that was sent in, again, hot takes are sent in uh, by multiple fans, and we discuss these. So the first one we're going to discuss is second half blowout games are where next year's standouts are created. Coaches that use those big leads to get the underclassmen reps are the programs that are the most competitive year after year. Keeping your starters in for style points and stats does not help your future. Guys, who wants to kick this one off? 100%. I agree 100%. Yeah, you look There's at teams about like that. Uh, Liberty Center, that's why they've got that revolving door of, yeah. of uh, games or of players because, you know, th- this year specifically, a lot of these kids are getting in second quarter, early third quarter, yeah. and playing a whole half a game. So, yeah. you know, you, and especially as you get down the road and you start playing a lot of playoff games too, you get more practices and things like that, and these kids start getting a lot of reps for next year. Yep, absolutely. I don't think that one's even – <laughs> no, I agree. I mean, great, great point, but I don't, there's not a lot to talk about because I agree 100 percent with that. If you if you don't get your younger kids involved and you're and you're keeping your starters out there for those style points, then those kids are just like, okay, I'm out here. Let's use Liberty Center as an example. If you've got 60 kids out and you don't get those younger kids in for reps to keep them interested, you know, the obviously you're going to play the better players, right? Right. And then you get, you know, next year I'm like, well, I'm not getting any reps now. Well, I'm not getting reps now. Well, then the next thing you know, you lose this kid, and he doesn't come back because he knows he's going to be sitting behind so and so next year, and I still won't get to play. And you know, at least if you're getting him some reps, getting him some Friday night light action. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this, your late third, entire fourth quarter with the running clock, will be your next year's team, right? For the most part, on offense and defense. For, for hey, I think, mean, yeah. So true. You, know, you get them a quarter of action, and then they go into off season with those memories thinking they have something to work for. Right. I mean, if they're sitting on the bench or I guess not bench standing on the sidelines the whole time, you know, what have they got to, to look forward to? You know, the other yeah. thing is, I'm sorry, Logan. The other thing yeah. is if, if you've got seniors that aren't playing, aren't starters, you know, you, they get in. So then there's an opportunity for them to get to play. So I mean, yep. that's, that's a good thing too. And I think the big thing goes as well. And, you know, even though it's a blowout game, there's nothing like playing under Friday night yep. lights. The kids that come out there, play JV, Saturday mornings and Monday afternoons are not like Friday yep. night lights. Absolutely. I don't care if it's a blowout game or not. Just to get under that, get under a, a good sized crowd. Yeah. It, there's it's an entirely different atmosphere, and I think that let alone it keeps kids interested in the yeah. program. Like you said, you know maybe seniors or upperclassmen that aren't playing as much, or the underclassmen getting them experience. And I tr- I truly believe, yeah. And it, again, we talk about success breeds success, and this is one prime example of what a contributing factor is you know it's getting these younger kids more reps uh, so then next year they can continue to carry on the tradition of their winning ways and things like that uh, a question that I also kind of you know think about too I mean if you have those successful programs gone are the days of you know breaking all these stats and records records and yeah. or the records that for the schools and the state and you talk about running clock now which they never had and we've kind of discussed this before yep. too you're not going to have these record-breaking performances like you have in the past. I think that's just a, right. another interesting point that kind of goes along with this is these blowout games that we see because if it's, what, 30 or more in the yeah. second half and you're not going to see guys throw or rush for 
300, 400 plus in a game or throw for 500 plus. It's not very often unless you play for Eden or Fairview. Yeah, so <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, you're if you're in a running clock, your plays are cut in half from what you would have during a regular yeah, you know, I mean, the yeah. second half. Look at what you know, Columbus Grove had a running clock in the second half this week. At Liberty Center so. would have had one. I mean, it was in the first half, but yeah. you don't do it until the second half. So right. they had a running clock the entire second half. Yeah, you're – yeah, you're probably running a quarter of the plays more than likely than what you would normally because yep. you you get the ball and if you're beating them that bad, you probably scored right away. Mm-hmm. And now now they've got the ball and whatever they're doing, and then you know yep. just the clock never stops. So yeah, you're. I just get curious. You bring that up, Logan. It makes me wonder. You know, when college coaches do their recruiting. Do they take that into consideration? I mean, like, oh, hey, I I really like Grady Miller, um, but um, you know, he's really not producing. I, I he's think playing a quarter and a half. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, no. Yeah. I think from the college standpoint, they definitely they look at your film and a lot of they want to see a lot of different things. Not only during the play, but they want to see you executing if oh, you're yeah. if you're not get off the ball scenarios you know right where you may if you're a wide receiver how are you doing blocking when the ball's away from you things like right. that uh they look at all that and yep. and they definitely see past the stats i think stats is just one thing but i, I think that's a thing too people think oh well, my stats aren't there i'm not going to get recruited that that's not the case but if you're good enough the coaches are going to find you and yeah. granted it is tougher a lot of times at your smaller schools because you know, it's harder to get more publicity, which is you know what we're doing. Yeah, we're right. trying so, to give yep. these kids more publicity, put their name out there, put them on the map. So if they want that opportunity to play at the next level, they can certainly have it. But uh, even like in my recruiting process when I was getting recruited by Finley, um, they actually looked at my basketball film and they had um, they had like looking at my footwork and things like that. It being me being an offensive lineman, they liked seeing a different aspect of how I could move and awesome. and uh, just kind of look at that. So I thought that was interesting. I didn't even know that they would look at other sports. <laughs> right. And they came to a couple <laughs> basketball games too and stuff like that. So oh, wow. that was yeah. really cool. Yeah, so. I had somebody tell me a story one time. I just kind of rolled into recruiting. But um, somebody told me a story. They went to watch a volleyball game, and they were recruiting this young lady that was at this – they are watching a club tournament, and they were recruiting this lady. And – they, they go and they watch them, their reactions on the bench and that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. and, this, and this young lady went off on her mom, I guess, because she got her the wrong color Gatorade. Oh, jeez. And oh. the coach heard all this, and this girl was just ripping her mom a new one because she got the wrong color Gatorade. And they literally were getting ready to get up and leave because, yeah, we're done. We don't want her anymore. And they decided to sit there and stay and ended up recruiting a girl from the other team that they were there, you know, they were there to watch the girl on one team yeah. and they end up recruiting a girl from the other team instead. Oh, um, wow. You know, so kids out there, if you're, if you're listening, I mean, college coaches, if they're really serious about you, they're looking at all aspects, oh, how you behave on the bench, how you behave when, like you said, when it plays away from you academically or, or too. when you're not in. Yeah. They're going to be looking keep at your all grades up. Yep. I, Cause I, I remember, I just look back and obviously I know this cause this is the only process I had for recruiting and I was recruited at the division two level. So not like division one, but right. Uh, coach Troy Rothenbuehler, Coach Corey Allen, and Coach Rob Keys, uh, you know, they were coming to the school and checking out things. And I believe, I'm not, don't quote me on this, but I, you know, I thought they might have even talked to some teachers too to see yep. kind of what kind of person you are and students. So, Absolutely. I mean, it just shows you really need to be a, a well rounded individual. And I mean, that makes you stick out above the others because you look at schools and they're only granted so many scholarships right. to give to you. And I mean, you really got to stick out above and all aspects in order to get that scholarship because especially the division two level, uh, you can split scholarships. They're not all full ride like division one, so they can split it. And, uh, you know, every little bit, and especially if you're going to college, college is expensive. So if you can get a couple (laughs) extra grand because, you know, you're treating your classmates correctly and (laughs) nicely and you're doing the right thing and it really pays off. And I mean, it could pay off for your tuition and scholarship too. So yeah, Uh, college coaches will look at a lot more than stats. That's for sure. That's a good one. But this next one is going to kind of tie into the same point in a sense. But football is dying a slow death in Northwest Ohio. If you do not have an organized, manageable youth football infrastructure, your varsity program may be suffering. Guys, I I want to say that there's some truth to this. I think you look at some of the teams and the numbers continue to, to dwindle and – I think there is a little bit of truth to this, I think, because you look at some of the more successful programs in the area, where does all this start? And I think if you can keep kids' interest at the younger youth levels, starting you know fifth, sixth grade, even into junior high, mm-hmm. and make those positive impacts on those kids and keep them interested in the game, so the fact that they don't get to 
the high school level and they're burnt out because either, you know, they didn't ever get a chance to play. And, you know, a lot of these kids, you know, could be late bloomers and so on and so forth. But that's kind of my initial thoughts. I'll get into it a little bit more, but I want you guys to talk about this as well. So what are your guys' thoughts? Tony, you're a junior high coach. <laughs> what are your kind of thoughts on this? Well, for me, junior high is definitely, it's part of your, that's when the kids first get their first true taste of the varsity. You know, we typically, most junior high programs one run what the varsity runs. So they get that extra couple of years of, of knowledge of what you're doing. Um, but, you know, a lot of programs, if you look around the area, like Edgerton has a fifth and sixth grade program. Fairview does. I think Ayersville does. Um, Wayne Trace. Um, you know, and now they're talking about, I think Tenora's talking about possibly going to like a tackle bar. They're going to get away from actually tackling in fifth and sixth grade. They're going to go, they're, and they're going to incorporate that under kind of their flag football program. It's not going to be a tackle football program. That's their talk. I'm not sure if it's actually happened yet or not. I think it is next year. Um, but, and, and whether that's the correct move or not, I don't know. But I know, we, you know, I had, we were just having this conversation the other day with, with a gentleman. And, you know, when you you look at fifth and sixth grade programs and you're, they're worried about keeping kids interested, you you can't take your fifth graders who are just out there, they're just learning the sport. They're, they don't even know whether they like it or not. They're doing it because their friends are doing it. More right, right. Yep. Like, oh, I'm going to play football because my friends are playing. And you can't take those kids – and line them up and let the sixth graders just beat the absolute crap out of them, which is one of the things that I've seen in my past. I've seen that happen. It was it was hit day, you know, and you get to line up, and you, the sixth grader got to pick the fifth grader, and they just lined up and they nailed each other. And, you know, that's how you scare kids away. You can't let those older kids just beat up on the younger kids. And we don't do that at our junior high program. You know, we, we scrimmage against each other, but we don't let them beat up on each other. We don't just line up and say, okay, go hit, you know, whoever, pick the little guy out here and go knock them out. Um, and you can't do that. If you want to keep kids interested, I think it's it's all in the, in the coaching styles and, and you know, again, keeping kids interested, getting them in the games, trying to help them, encourage them. And, you know, we, the one thing we always tell our kids, if I'm not yelling at you, then, then you've got a problem. Because if I'm yelling at you, I'm trying to get something out of you that we see. Right. Yep. So that's the thing. But – I mean, I don't know that it's dying a slow death in Northwest Ohio. I don't, and I guess I don't know what they mean by that. I, I just look at it in terms of numbers dwindling, not only among at the varsity levels, but at the youth levels too. Uh, you know, a lot of programs, the numbers just keep going down and down and down compared to what they were. Yeah, I think I mean, that's I think that's where they're going in terms of that. But I, yeah, I guess maybe in that aspect, that if you guys jump in, don't. Uh, I, I think it really depends on you know where you're looking. I think. On the extremes, yes, but I think those middle of the road teams that have always had forty ish kids are still at that thirty five forty. You know, you look at for us, Tenora, we don't have less than what we did when I was in school by much. I mean, I think we only really averaged thirty five forty kids when I was in school. Yeah. Uh, so you know, a lot of those teams in the middle of the road are kind of the same. I mean, even back when I was in school. Antwerp didn't even have a team for yeah. a year, two years. I mean, like, like for that. you guys, and they came back. At so. more, and up years, probably what fifty. Yeah, my junior and senior year, where we we were, I would say we were probably at the peak of Tenor football. We made two back to back state semifinal berths, GMC champs, all that. We had fifty plus kids. I think. Right. I think we want to um, maybe middle fifties. If I yeah, and that's, remember, that's a so. big class. We, yeah. I mean, at our junior high level right now, we have I think nineteen on both seventh and eighth grade levels. We have nineteen kids at both 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 sides so you know as as far as and that's one of the bigger classes that i've took i've coached in the 13 years or 14 years that i've been doing it um you know we used to have it's, that's always the number you know there's been years we've had 13 or 14 then there's years we'll have 15 16 17 18 i think there's been one maybe one or two years where we've had 20 plus but that's the that's the i mean that's the exception to the rule we never yeah. have that many i think it comes but, down to the the varsity coaching staff how well how involved they are with the younger ages. And, you know, if they can get the varsity players to help support the, the younger kids and get the interactions at the different levels, that helps drastically to get those kids interested. Uh, you see that at a lot of schools like Liberty Center. You know, they, they've got 70 kids for a reason. It's not like they just got lucky and have the biggest team in, in Northwest Ohio. You know, they're, they're doing things to cultivate that culture young and and. A lot of schools do that. Columbus Grove has pretty good programs. A lot of the GMC schools, they, they have good programs. You know, they're not dying by any means. You have a couple of them that might be struggling a little bit, but 
you're also talking about schools, D5, D6, even D7 schools that just don't have large populations of kids anyways. So when you're talking that they're dying, it's like they're still about the same where they were years ago for the most part. I don't know. I, I think another big thing too, you know, talking about youth football, and we could go on and on for this, but I think a big thing that can contribute to big programs, and obviously I'm not a youth coach or anything, but – just witnessing and seeing how I think I think a big thing is how kids are coached now. I yep. think in a time and we talked about this earlier, yep. you cannot coach kids hard like you used to because they're not they're <laughs> no they're, they're, they're not going to respond, especially at the youth level. And you look at a time and a day and age where in society where you know we have video games, there's a lot of outside distractions, a lot of things that pull kids away from sports. You know, there's a lot of different excuses. I think more so now than ever. You know, back then, you know, you either played sports or, you know, there wasn't, I don't know, you yeah. didn't have like a game, uh, I don't know, whatever gaming system you wanted. <laughs> Xbox, play Fortnite yeah. all day. You didn't have that around. Right. But now, I mean, kids are really drawn to that stuff, which, I mean, to each their own. But, again, it kind of pulls away from that sense. So, I think one is a coaching style. So, I don't think yep. you can just, you can't harp and ride a kid like you used to. I mean, right. back in the day. Uh, you're you know, not going to grab a kid re- by the face mask. You could really you know? get a, yeah, you could really get away with a lot. Yep. I think the other thing too is at the younger levels, and this is not only just football, but I see it a lot in baseball too. At the younger youth levels, I think the big thing is you know getting the kids in and playing. I think a lot of times, and obviously everyone wants to win, but don't let the fact of winning override of you know what the future for these kids could be. Great, you know, teach them the fundamentals. Make the sport fun. I think that's a big thing. I think uh, on a kickoff show, Coach Cooper, I think, yeah. had brought up something about making things fun for the yep. kids. I mean, that's what it's all about. I mean, at the end of the day, football is a game, and you want to make it enjoyable for the kids out there. So um, especially at the youth level, to keep their attention, you got to make things fun, whether it's making different tackling drills into games, <laughs> things like right. that. Keep them occupied and let some of the kids – that may not be the most talented at, at that point in time. So there's a huge you, difference in, in, in you de- know, growth and, and development and too, yeah. because I was going to say, you know, those kids that are, you know, maybe not the most athletic and they can't walk and chew gum and tie their shoes and all that <laughs> stuff at the same time, you know, who's to say, and I've seen it before, you know, you get into junior high, freshman, sophomore, and these kids really blossom. They grow about six inches. They put on about 50 pounds. And now you're looking at your starting Mike linebacker potentially, but you never made it get to that opportunity because the kid quit when he's in sixth grade because, right. like you said, you're doing a drill or – like when we played, I remember we did hamburger drill where yeah. you just stood up and you just took it – you just tackled each other there and it was just kind of built toughness, which I'm not saying there, there's drills you can do to do that, right. but uh, you don't want to deter some of those kids away. So that's kind of my two cents. I mean, you think the big things are you got to make it fun for the kids and, uh, yeah, you just got to gotta make them – Enjoy it. So the thing that the thing and you you mentioned coaching, both you and AJ did. The thing that I have with it is, you know, when you look at the youth football, um, even in junior high levels, uh, you know, Reyes Ramirez and I have been doing this for a long time. He's been doing it for. I mean, he's he's actually coaching kids of kids that he coached (laughs) back then. I mean, he's been doing it forever, and. you know, I've been doing it for a long time as well now. Jeez, but yeah, you coach me too. Yeah, I coach both you guys. <laughs> so, and- um, you know, so I've been doing it for a long time. And, and um, you know, what Reyes and I have talked about this a little bit. You know, it's through all the years that we've been coaching. And, again, Reyes has been probably there twice as long as me. You start you, – you know, when we go to these other schools, you see different coaches. And you see a different coach. And you see a different coach. Yep. And you see a different coach. Like year after – you know, they'll be there for a couple of years and then they're gone. Then they'll be there for a couple of years and they're gone. It's like – and, you know – Reyes and I've been doing it for a long time. Reyes has been there forever. Um, you know, there there was a period of time there for five or six years that we had the same junior high staff that never changed. It was me and Rob Gieske and Rob Saragan and Reyes. Which we were the four that were there. And when you go to all those other schools and you get different coaches, and the point I'm getting ready to make is most of them are dads. You know, they go in there, they coach their kids, which is how I got started. Um, but – you know, when you go to the youth programs, and and this goes for baseball, softball, football, whatever, the fifth and sixth grade levels like that in football, it's parents coaching kids. And, you know, and like you said, keeping it fun for everybody and, and not just giving it to, to Johnny football and letting him run for touchdowns seven times a game. Right. And, yep. You know, because he's the best athlete. And I've seen that happen in the past. Um Nobody else gets excited about it because, oh, yeah, all right, yeah, he scored again. Yeah, well, like I always you said, know, no one's gonna no one's gonna care or remember. Oh, you won a little league championship 
back when you're in fourth, fifth grade, right. you know, people yeah. are going to be remember, you know, the state title that right, you won right. in high school or your junior, senior year, rather than, you know, all the yeah. little league stuff. So you know, and being a high school coach myself, you know, in softball, you know, I really work with my youth leagues and I try to, you know, we, I sit down every year and have a, a, you know, like a meeting with my coaches that are those youth leagues and try to drive home. Like, okay, keep it, keep it simple. Keep it, keep it fun. Teach them the fundamentals. And, you know, we go over some things that, you know, that we do at our varsity level. So it, so these kids, as these kids grow, they're, they're hearing some of the same terminology that we use. So when they get to us, it's not like, okay, we got to start all over again. Right. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't know if it would be, if it's dying a slow death or not, but I hope not. I mean, cause Northwest Ohio football, football is pretty awesome to watch in my book. It is. Oh yeah. Yeah, but the two things, yeah, I couldn't remember what the other thing was earlier. Make it fun and get the kids playing time at a young yeah, age. I think yeah. those two things are the big contributing factors. So, yeah. Keith, AJ, you got any other final no, points? No, I think no, that's I'll it. just kind of cap it off, but keep it limited for me. Um, number one, families aren't as big as what they used to be. Like when yeah, we were that's true, up. too. Like you don't have five, six-member families anymore. It's maybe two. So your your total you can choose from is already limited. And I just don't think it's limited to just football. If you look across all sports – uh, you, I mean, Coach Fairchild's seen it in softball. Like, he didn't have a JV team this year. Like, all sports, you can see the attendance and everything just sort of dwindle. I was going to say, every, another thing throughout with the this dying point is I was going to bring up as, as attendance of sports. You look back, yep. uh, I think there's old video footage in the old Allen R. Oh, Moore Gymnasium. Geez, yep. That thing was packed. It was standing room only. And didn't matter what Granted, that was, was a small arena, right. but, I mean, it was Yep. packed house and you watch all those old yep. films from the 80s the 90s yep. and everyone and their brother was at every yep. single high school sporting event but again i think it goes back to there's so many distractions in today's yep. day and age you know there's a lot of other things going on and i think right. it just kind of gets put to the side which is unfortunate because yep. that's why i like high school sports so much is because it's all at a local level you know you go out yep. there you know this player or that player and you can discuss with families and and you're always going to kind of builds this, a community with yeah, each other yeah, and yeah you're always going to run into two or three guys you haven't seen for years so yeah. i mean it's it, it, it just brought this up you know numerous times community involvement community oh, involvement yeah. and back then like you just said Logan, that was that was a thing to do on friday and saturday nights is go watch a basketball game yeah. or go watch a football game and um i mean even honestly like for basketball for instance even when i was in school you know 11 years ago there was still a lot of community in the Allen R gym, you know, gymnasium. Yeah. The stupid it was student still section packed. was crazy. <laughs> and we would have that, the student section up on the stage, completely packed. No, yeah. no room on the bleachers. People would be standing yeah. around the bleachers trying to find a spot to watch the game. Everywhere, and, yeah. I mean, it was packed in there. I even and remember it's like the last, you know, 10 years, seven, eight yeah. years here. It's just dropped. I mean, we go to some of these games, and you're lucky if you have five, six kids in the student sections anymore. Yeah. I mean, even at the football games, you know, you have, you know, Maybe a dozen or two, you know, really kids that are really into the, There's some kids standing around, but, you know, you don't pack a student section, you know, 20 rows deep and, you know, yep. road, you know, aisleway to aisleway. I just, I don't know. Some schools we go to, we see that. Yeah. Right? I was going to bring up uh, the old Ayersville gymnasium when there was a basketball <laughs> game there. That place was packed too. And another great environment yeah, and all yeah. kinds of people would show up. So and, hot in that gym. <laughs> yeah, I will say though, like I said, the Tenora Fairview game last Friday and, we know like Liberty Center always brings big crowds. Columbus Grove always yeah. brings crowd big crowds. But you know, Tenora it's kinda iffy at times and they really showed up and, and there were a lot of other events too. They had Biddy cheerleading yeah. and I think junior high band night and they had a couple other things going yeah. on and And then the weather wasn't the greatest leading no, up to right, right. six thirty. So I mean we had a lot of uh, late arrivals, but yeah, it was as that's what I wish every crowd on Friday night yeah. was like that. I know, that's why I try I mean I was trying hard to promote the event yeah. as much as possible. I know yeah. Keith was too. And I mean, it just makes it much more enjoyable for everyone involved, the players, the coaches, the fans, everyone. Yeah. If, if you have a big crowd and great. you see everyone show up and it just makes everything 10 times better. So, yep. All right. That was a good one. So yeah, definitely a great two first hot takes to start things off. So we're going to move on to a little bit different subject. This is going to go more for player safety, but guardian caps are now being worn in NFL games and are legal for Ohio high school football from my quick research should be, should we be looking at getting the kids this extra protection? So, so if, for those of you who don't know, guardian caps are those external caps. They've got kind of pads and cushions you put up over the outside of your helmet. It's becoming really popular in the NFL. Some NFL guys are actually wearing them during games too. So 
<laughs> I was telling these guys, I think there is a study that was released, and they're still coming out with things, but I thought I read something that in the NFL it's reduced concussion rates by 20%. Don't quote me on that. That's just what I thought I, I remember hearing somewhere. So, guys, what are your initial thoughts on the guardian caps? Think high school kids should be using them? Dr. AJ. <laughs> <laughs> I, careful, Dr. AJ. Yeah, so I have to be careful <laughs> on my recommendations and stuff like this due to uh, malpractice purposes. But um, if I would be to recommend anything, it's strength and conditioning, you know, good strength and conditioning program will help reduce a lot of these. The more that the kids' bodies the get neck. used to it. <laughs> for the neck, yeah, neck, muscles, things like that. The more the kids' bodies get used to being banged around a little bit in practices and things like that, the better off you're going to be able to handle some of these injuries. Uh, you you look at the number one position for concussions is quarterback. They're the ones that take the least amount of hits through practices because they're always being coddled. I mean, the best way to put it, they're being coddled through practice. You're, they're not allowed to hit them. They're not allowed to be touched during practice, which I get. You know, you're trying to make sure nothing happens to, you, to your star quarterback. But, you know, you get out in a game, and, and they're not going to coddle to him. So he takes that one hit. And all of a sudden, oh, crap, now he's got a concussion because he, you know, bumped his head off somebody's knee, which is <laughs> extremely likely. Uh, you know, you look at, like, the NFL. You got people in the NFL that have the best of the best equipment, you know, like Tua Tagovailoa. He, he's got some of the best equipment you can have, yet he's the one that suffers some of the most severe concussions on hits that don't even look like he really hit the ground hard. Right. You know, there was one – I can't even remember which one it is now because he's had so many. But he kind of just landed on the ground, didn't really hit his head off anything, just kind of hit the ground, and he was, like, catatonic, like, fingers all crossed and everything, and he didn't even do anything. It's like mm -hmm. a lot of this is because their bodies are not conditioned for it anymore because they're getting away from a lot of the, um, you know, high-impact stuff because they're worried people are getting hurt, but then they go out there on Sunday nights or, you know, on high school football on Friday nights, and they're in those high-impact environments, and they're not used to it. Yeah, so the, the, you're bringing up a great point, and I, I want to touch on that. Look at the quarterbacks who don't run the ball much compared to the quarterbacks who run the ball a lot, the Josh Allens. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the Lamar Jacksons, those kind of guys who run the ball a lot. They're taking some hits, you know, and, you know, they take some pretty good hits when they oh, run yeah. the ball. And you don't see those guys coming down with concussions versus the guys who don't get hit. Um, you know, I mean, you never saw Tom Brady with a concussion because he, I mean, and I've seen him take some pretty good shots as yeah. well. But, um, but, you know, I don't know, just the day and age, it, it just, my thoughts on the whole process, I don't think you can, you can put whatever you want on the outside of the helmet. I don't think it's going to stop a darn thing because the speed of the game has increased so much with the athletes being bigger, faster, stronger. We talked about this before. you got athletes running at 20 mile an hour. The brain's still going to move inside the skull. You can put all the padding you want on the outside. The brain's still going to slap around inside the skull. And is the cushion going to help a little bit? I think most Maybe of a little the, bit. the improvements that can be made for player safety is mechanics. I was just tackle. about to say is, is – Instead your... of – you know, I think – and I think the better the helmets get – believe it or not, the mechanics get worse because they feel that, okay, now I got this extra padding in my helmet, so now I can afford to hit with my head a little bit when in reality, that's not true at all. You know, that hit to your head is still a hit to the head with right. four inches of padding or two inches of padding. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, it might make a minuscule amount of difference, but the, you know, tackling a little better form makes really big, you know, changes. Yeah. And I think makes the biggest I was just about to say, I think tackling form is a huge one and, you know, proper head placement, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, chin up. Actually, it's funny that we're talking about this subject. Do you guys know who Eric Legrand is? He was a former Rutgers player, became paralyzed due to a hit. He was running down on kickoff. Well, anyways, I watched that video. It's sickening to watch. I mean, it's it's tough to watch because you know what the end result is. But he runs downfield and he's trying to make a tackle on the guy. He leads right with his head and – just seeing how his head placement was, you can understand how he, he, I believe he fractured his vertebrae and stuff like that. And granted things happen. I mean, right. you can't always control it. And, and this guy, Eric Legrand is doing great things. I believe he's a motivational speaker. He's done great things with his life since then. So it's absolutely incredible to follow his story, but again, really making sure, you know, they, they talk about targeting and things like that. People leading with the head. I mean, it's not only safety for the person that's 
taking the blow, but also administering it because, right. you know, you lead with that head and you don't get your head around to where it's supposed to be. I mean, you're going to end up seriously injured. And I think that's the biggest thing. But I guess my opinion on this topic too is talking about the guardian caps. If you have had multiple concussions and you're at risk of you know, high risk of having another one and possibly losing your football career, I'd probably lean towards, yeah, you should anything that could possibly help. I think you should probably wear it. Even if, right. you know, if it's going to possibly reduce it by 20%, if it's not going to reduce it at all, but any form of extra protection, if you're on the brink of losing your career or having another concussion and something as simple as putting on an extra cap, I'd say more power to you. Um, that's kind of my thoughts on things, but I think the biggest thing is, is technique and form. And you even go back to Tua, I think even just the way of, and again, it's hard because things happen so quick, right? Mm -hmm. Especially at the NFL level. But if you can learn to fall correctly, you know what I mean? Like right. instead of just falling backwards, if you can almost brace yourself. Yeah. And again, it's, it's easier said than done. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of those guys that, you know, look at quarterbacks that don't have concussions, I think they do a really good job at taking blows and, you know, properly landing and falling and things like that if they can. I know it's not always it, possible right? because they're so, used yeah. to it. So. A lot of that comes with the experience of yep. being hit. You yep. know, you know, if you get hit from the side, how you're going to fall and what hurts because you've had it happen before. I think it was a lot of it's neck strength. Yep. You know, like for me, you know, being a youth coach, I watch kids all the time. And I have a double side, two sides to this, but <laughs> watching kids fall. And, you know, you see kids fall down and they bang their head off the ground and, you know, they get up and they're like, you know, their head's hurting and all this. You, and you really look at it, it. I look at it in the back of my mind going, he didn't hit the ground all that hard. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it, and to, to say you have a concussion, but then they go get checked and they have a concussion. Here, you know, you're like, wow. Here you go, Tony. Talking about neck strength. This is from an academic journal. Uh, neck strength, a protective factor reducing risk for concussion in high school sports. This study found for every one pound increase in neck strength, odds of concussion decreased by 5%. Yeah, there you go. So, I mean, that's another factor. Geez, I mean, you, I, just, I just pulled that out of my butt. I didn't even read it. <laughs> well, it's a, I, I, I'm one. I always like things supported by facts right, and stuff. Absolutely. So yeah. I, I like, I mean, especially AJ probably knows, you know, yep, being in the medical Google field, yeah, we, we like to look at, you know, journal articles right, and right. studies and things like that. Peer reviewed and, actual yes. research, not just some, somebody's blog post down right. there. But, but you know, the other, yeah. the other side of it, you know, being an old school coach too, you know, sometimes I see kids fall down and they, you know, I'm not blaming any of the kids. Please, if anybody's watching, don't get this wrong. But I think kid, some kids know the trigger words. I'm dizzy. I have a headache. Done. You know, and that's that's our job as coaches. You're done. You say you tell me you're dizzy. You got a headache. You're done. You're out. I, I'm not taking that chance. I'm not going to take the chance getting my butt in trouble by playing you if you're dizzy and have a headache. And I think that also rolls into the medical side of things, the trainers, the doctors, and all those guys. Like, oh, you say you got a headache and you're okay. Well, then you're out. Because nobody wants to have that repercussion if they decide to, oh, no, you can right. play. And nobody then they end up with them. something serious, and now your butt's on the line. So, I don't know. I, I think sometimes, you know, like I said, I see kids take hits that I, I don't think they should have had a concussion from. But you see them, you know, as they hit the ground, their head whips and back, and then their, their head bounces off the ground pretty good. And you just like, you know, back in the day, you know, the helmets that we had, guys, were a <laughs> solid piece of foam pad and a helmet, and then they had an air bladder in there, and they put it on your head, and it, it made it fit tighter to your head. That was it. You didn't have all this extra padding and foam and all these air cushions and all that stuff. It was a, it was a solid piece of foam, and they had an air bladder in it to help it fit tighter to your head. That was it. You all right. <laughs> Keith, what are you thinking down there? Um, if we're just talking high school level. I guess you got to look into cost. You know, if, that's the thing. I all, think they're kind of pricey. I don't yeah, know. If all, I'm not, I don't what know what for. the exact price is, but if you're looking to outfit, say, I, I guess if you're looking to go high school, junior high level, you're probably looking at upwards of a hundred. So I'm not. I mean, as far as athletic programs, there's not too many athletic programs that can can just pull it out of their budget these days. Depending so, what model it is, uh, this looks like a basic model, seventy bucks per one. If you're looking at the NFL model, which looks like it has a little bit more padding, $125. Yeah. Wow. Not as bad as what I thought, though. I mean, honestly, I was right. thinking it was going to be a couple hundred dollars a yeah. piece. But well, then how long do they last? And Because yeah, you know, they're worn on the outside of the helmet, right. obviously, right? Yes, right. they take yeah. abuse. You know, maybe, the, the, honestly, if if you don't wear them during games, maybe they should be required for practice. I think most you NFL know? players do wear them in oh, practice. Oh, I would 100% wear well, yeah, them during I practice. See Kelsey wearing it during practice. Because during pra practice at Finley, we used to – you know, when you line up in drills and you're one-on-one, mono-me-mono, offensive and defensive line, I mean, 
you're going to crack skulls sometimes. Yeah. And if he's called slosh brain, I don't know if that was a good thing or probably a bad <laughs> thing. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would a hundred percent wear him during practice yeah. for sure. I mean, yeah. that's just my personal opinion I mean, playing you, of a you, lot of years. Like, and I like get Sonora, we use beanies, you know, for the helmets yeah. to, to determine the office defense, just give them a different color. And they basically yeah. you, they could be your beanies, you know, and I don't know. Anyway, yeah. No, oh, interesting topic, but Very. I think it's it's something to look at. I think yep. it's a combination of, sure, I think you can wear the, the caps. I think that will help some. Uh, neck strength, that's going to certainly help reduce c- concussion risk. And then the big one is, is form and technique and, you know, whether that be tackling mechanics or bracing yourself on a fall and learning how to properly go down and things like that. Yeah. I think it can all play in a role. But at the high school level, um, I mean, I th- – I mean, 70 bucks is fairly affordable. I mean, yeah. especially if they, you know, they would last a few seasons and if it could help protect your, you know, son playing football or whatever, or, you know, go work a couple hours and buy one and save your brain. So there you go. All right, let's move on to the next one here. All of high school football should have one bye week or a bye week into the playoffs. Interesting point. Um, <laughs> technically, you can have a bye week because – if you don't have anyone scheduled that yeah, week, we course. I had that once my junior year. I know some teams have had it, I think, I'm sure this year. Uh, what team? Cardinal Stritch dropped late, yeah. and I think I think a lot of the teams were able to pick up an yeah, extra yeah, game. I think but, Eden just did finally, I mean, right before the season started, picked up somebody. But regardless, I mean, I think you can afford to have a bye week now. Geez, with 16 teams per region making it, it's really not going to hurt you as long as you win most of your games, but – Thoughts during the regular season? I really like the idea of going into postseason. It gives you a week to prepare, kind of rest up, get healthy, and then you hit hit the ground running come playoffs. I like that idea. Regular season, uh, I mean. This is kind of what we talked about. More we talked about more so in the playoffs, but are we talking all teams or some teams? If we're talking all teams, I don't know that you can do that. I mean, high school football already goes close to past Thanksgiving, does it not? Oh, it goes I to think, so, December. Yeah. I you know, think the playoff game's got to be – well – well, so if you start, say you start practice August 1st and you, you go deep into the playoff run, you're already practicing at least on Thanksgiving most times, and then your playoff, if you make it to the so What is it, 16 final. games if you make it to the yep. final game? Yep. I think that I think it's got to be cut down. I mean, we, right. we had talked about so, this topic before, and 16, that's more, that's, than, that's more than college teams play. So, But, right. I mean, we're talking now, we got so many mismatches in your 116, your 215. <laughs> Like, if you want to give a first-round bye to, say, your top eight seeds, I mean, I don't have any problem with that because most of those games are irrelevant anyways. You're looking at a 50 nothing running clock by the half for the most part anyway. So I don't really don't have a problem giving a bye week to, say, your top eight seeds, I guess. I mean, because your bye week or how many teams get a – six? There's 16 teams in the playoffs. No, no one gets a bye week anymore. No, no, no that's not. right. No, no. One plays 16, so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah I, I think you could do that. You get a top eight – Top eight a buy, and then the bottom eight got to play, and then yeah, the lowest seed from goes there. to yeah, the I highest. That would be the lowest seed remaining sense. would go to the highest yep. seed. But as far as giving a bye week during the regular season, that's it's nearly impossible. Yeah. Right? you only play ten weeks anyway. So yeah, you, yeah. you just look at logistics of things, and it's yep. just not feasible. So yeah, hey, you see, I don't like the idea of having a bye week because I want more football. <laughs> I mean, as a, <laughs> yeah. as a player yeah. standpoint, <clears throat> football is the shortest season ever. I mean, you get ten games guaranteed yeah. and and those 10 weeks fly by yeah. i mean it feels like i mean here we are sitting week six already on the outside looking in let yep. alone as an athlete like you just you blink and the season's gone yeah. so to have so a bye week and lose one of those games would be yeah. worse so, <laughs> so i got a question the college plays what 14 with the national championship this is the way it was right now the way it is right now well they now the i think michigan playoff, won, i'm not what, sure michigan Played 15 last year, I think. 15 or 15. There's something like and that. And they have two bye weeks in their schedule. This year they do, yes. This, this Most year teams. they have two bye, you know, because I know Ohio State has two bye weeks. Well, you figure this year, basically so. their schedule, they go from. Well, they only played two and, games and had a bye week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they the college season, you go, what, end of August, beginning of September. But then if you make it the national championship, that's what? February. You're Yeah, pretty much, yeah, you're looking at February. So that's almost two months longer than yeah. what high school goes, so. That's a, you can't. There's no way Middle you could January. do that in high school because basketball season runs yep. in. And, right. Yeah. Interesting point. I yep. I would I would personally like to see maybe a bye week between the end of the regular season and beginning of playoffs. But, but you uh, have to eliminate it. But you're going to have to eliminate some games. Then yeah, there's no yeah. way. Yeah. 
I think drop some of those bottom teams out. Maybe do like a twelve team. Or if you're going to do, six, gonna, do sixteen, do what Keith mentioned and do it eight bottom eight play, and the top yeah. eight don't. Yeah. That way you don't have to. Which, which I think eventually they may do that because, uh, like I said, <clears> the one sixteen <throat> matchups are just pointless. Most yeah. most of them. Yeah, I mean Nobody they, they really anyway. are. So. It's not like in basketball where you're going to have a 16 seed knock off a right. one seed. Yep. <laughs> you know what? It's not going to happen. Right. Yeah, I think that's the biggest complaint too is you know, quality of playoffs yeah. now with 16. 16 is just a, that's too, that's way four, too many. That's 14. Many. I think there's been a lot of kickback from it too. I think everyone and their brother has. But the coaches said, voted for supposedly. So I mean, I don't know. That's what I've I mean read and heard. Multiple well, I could just tell you so. though in Division One when there's only 16 teams per region and all 16 make it. Yeah, that's embarrassing. It was always the thing with football. <laughs> it, was, it was it was the one sport that you took a lot of pride in making the playoffs. Yeah. You had to be one of the best teams to make it, and now everyone and their brother makes it every year. So. Ten. I think there's only ten. And you can make it with a losing record and so per region back then. Yep. Yeah. So what did what did you what was that one thing you sent out, Keith? There's very possible that a one and nine team. That won the very yeah, I think Logan only, did. Only, only won the first yeah. game of the season, then lost nine straight. Could be facing another one and nine team in the playoffs. Yeah, there's something I don't know. <laughs> I don't even remember that. what it was. It was something yeah. crazy along that's those nuts. lines. That's but nuts. They won a nine game losing streak <laughs> and they made the playoffs. It's like yeah. happened last year. But uh, let's move on to the next one here. The NWAL will have a near clap similar to the Pac-12 if slash when Swanton leaves. No, I don't think I don't agree with this. You'll one. have teams fighting to take that spot. As yeah, it's going to be this. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the complete opposite. I think. Yeah, I, I don't. Well, s- the, N- leaves the NWAL is what one of the oldest yeah. conferences, yep. is, most is successful it? as well. Yeah, one right? of the most successful in all of the state of Ohio. Mm-hmm. So, I I don't see that being an issue. Yes. I, I mean, I do see it being a real possibility that Swanton does leave because there's been that talk for years and yep. years. Um, but. Uh, you know, I just hey, don't know who fills that. That's what I, I was mean, about to say. Who fills that role? Because we've discussed this in the past. I mean, you've already got you've got Evergreen. I mean, basically all the you got Evergreen. You got I mean, Brian. Is this like Napoleon school wise on the same? Um, I think we had talked maybe about Napoleon joining. Just because, as far as enrollment, I think they got to be close to Archibald or or Liberty Center. Well, I think I think Napo- bigger. They're Napoleon bigger. is I mean, they're slightly bigger. I think Napoleon would be comparable to like a Brian. I, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't think they'd be any different than Brian. I mean, Napoleon right. would by far be the biggest in the NWL, but I think competitiveness, I think they would they go would they, fit, right. we'll, they would we'll, fit pretty yeah. well. Yeah. I think the big thing is it's tough now cuz Napoleon has to travel up to Toledo and play all these teams now yeah. and and then they have so many different sports Napoleon does that other schools do not. So That's I where think the problem Napoleon, comes in and Napoleon yeah. has swimming and diving and all unless that. Unless you stuff. go right. unless you go into where maybe they're in certain sports for NWL, and then they're in another conference league, for other right. sports. Yeah. I mean, they. I mean, you think about look, no, look at the BBC. Yeah, BBC is all scattered. BBC all is kind of scattered. Yeah, so. I mean, you think about Napoleon though. Now, I mean, like Liberty Center now has has a uh, soccer. Brian has soccer. Um, you know, I don't know what other schools up there have soccer, but you, know, you start thinking about all these other schools that have soccer now. That was that was always a big thing for like Defiance and Napoleon. They had soccer. Nobody else did. Um, so I, I don't know. I. I don't think the NWA Hill is going to have a collapse if oh, if, gosh, if they no. if they drop Swanton and nobody fills the fills the spot, but NWA Hill is going to go right on by. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, I think Napoleon would be a good spot for because it's right in the middle of the NWA Hill. I mean, you got Patrick Henry to the south, Liberty Center, Wasion to the north. I mean, they're kind of towards the eastern side of it because you got Brian all the way on the western side of it. But I mean, they fit right in. I mean, half the teams are right in their neighborhood. They border, you know. Other NWA. So this is going into last year. So Napoleon has approximately four fifty total enrollment. So That's a pretty big class. Yeah. What does Brian have? Um, I'm just curious. Because I, mean, I think Brian would have to be them or Wasion would probably have to be the this, next. This used to be very easily accessible on the OHSA site, and this year for whatever reason they made it a lot more difficult to find all this stuff. <laughs> now you got to go through an entire list before we can just type it in. Um. Who are we looking for Brian? Let's say Brian's enrollment has. Brian to be. has four, four, uh, four twenty-eight. Oh wow! So same, so close. Yeah, basically the same. same. Yep. More or less, yeah. Yeah, so, I think I think Napoleon would be a good fit. It'd be the most logical yeah. if if and Swan were to leave. And that would be, uh, 
a, a big change for the NWAL. I mean, that's they're, that's a they're Napoleon's a competitive team. I mean, they've got the facilities, they got the turf field. Yeah. Got, but then you nice. look at like schools like Evergreen. You know, being a smaller school yeah. playing a Napoleon. Mm-hmm. How does how does that work? I don't know. Like yeah, like Archibald well, I mean, Evergreen has, plays Bryan. I mean, Archibald so has you, close to three hundred. Sure. So. They play Bryan. They play Delta. I don't know what yeah, Delta's enrollment is, but you know it's uh, Wasion. I mean, there's, I don't know. I mean, I look at Evergreen as a farm school. I look at Evergreen as like a Tenora, right? Absolutely. And then <laughs> you know, then you got the Wasions, you got the you know, the Deltas, you got the you know, not Liberty Center really, because I mean, Liberty Center is a town, but yeah, Liberty Center um, still. I, I, yeah. I feel like they're a farm school, but <clears throat> yeah, they're a farm school, but they got there's a little town there, yeah. you know. But um, you know, like I said, you got Brian and those guys, so I don't know. Evergreen's about the size of Sonora. PH, I mean, PH is definitely a farm school. Yeah, you know? 100%. <laughs> yeah. They do have Hamler right there, but. Hamler and Deschler and yeah. all the good communities of Henry County. Yeah, Liberty, <laughs> Liberty's got about 260. Okay. Yeah, interesting hey. topic. Yep. So a couple more here. We'll wrap things up. Uh, Columbus Grove has the best uniforms in Northwest Ohio. Bold statement. There's a lot of good uniforms. We got to see the. I'd assume they're pretty new uniforms. Opening week against yeah, Pandora Bowen. Nice. Kind of almost like Ohio State. They looked very yeah, sharp. I will cool. say, yeah. from their helmets to their uniforms, that red looked really crisp. And the helmets, mm-hmm. I, I like those a lot. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of some other uniforms that really pop off. You know, just off the top of my head, what kind of uniforms stick out? I think to we you had guys? this conversation last year, the year before. Like Napoleon. to me, like Fairview with a different combo. Has some of the best looking uniforms. Like last week, they think they had white on white, which wasn't a bad look. But they have like a a black jersey with white pants that looks pretty awesome. The one I think they have a yellow jersey at times. They wear yellow with, jersey with black pants, right? So yeah. It looks pretty awesome. Yeah. So um, I I really liked Archbold's military yeah. style uniform. We could actually see the numbers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah they looked really good. Yeah. Just couldn't see the players; they were invisible. Yeah, <laughs> didn't right. Pull, didn't right. Pull you do that. Camo. Uh, I think last the boy year, usually does something like that, that too. Yeah. They had the red helmets last year. Someone had to crack that bad joke. So. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Was, uh, Columbus Grove's got some some nice uniforms. Absolutely agree with that. I think uh, I'm just trying to think of other ones. Um, I'm really a, I'm not really a Delta. fan. Of, I kind of like Deltas that that green. I don't know. I just is I like, like, a, I like bright. brighter colors. Yeah, it's like a spring green. It is. Know. It's like a like a I don't know. I think they call it like a Kelly green or something. Yeah, I think it's spring, color. spring green, I yeah. think is what it's called. I mean, okay. you can never go wrong with Liberty Center either. I'm a big fan of orange and yeah. black, as everyone yeah. can see I, here. I, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, I bled orange and black for quite a few years there, so just, I can I'm never go wrong with Liberty Center. Old school. I'm not a fan on color, like black on black. I don't like, I just don't like, that's just me being the old school football fan. I'd rather see like a dark jersey, white pants, or vice versa. Like black on black, or or even white on white's pretty awesome. I don't mind that if you got the right helmet, but and your and your sleeves and white on white get you some white cleats. Oh, there you go, go. You <laughs> white shoes, Johnson. Oh, that's right. But yeah, like dark on dark to me is just like uh, awful color rush uniform from the NFL. Those things are awful. Oh, <laughs> I would say I, I like I like the colors that are they really kind of contrast each other. Like you said, if you could get you know a dark color with a light color mixed in there, yeah. I think that just looks very yeah. sharp, very crisp. Um, so much. And I like that look. Yep. So. Girls in the softball team are trying to get me to get white pants. I'm like, whoa, oh, you no, never way. Get clean. no way. Take them to the car wash you know, after the game. <laughs> you say that, you say that, but I'm like looking back in the day and going, how how in the world did my mom ever get my football pants? Because we used to wear white pants. I'm like, how did you ever get my pants clean? Because I remember coming home and those things would be trashed. And you pull them out and put them on your you know, your backpack or book bag for the next week and they're clean. And like, well, that, that was I, before I the days of like Oxy clean and all that stuff. Yeah. We had like three detergents back then. <laughs> yeah, I, I did some scrubbing. There was another kind of hot take and I'll just th- attach this to this one, but uh, each team should have an alternate uniform. I'm a hundred percent. If you have the funds, oh, yeah. get an alternate Definitely. uniform. I, I would think with Tenora, I'd almost like to see maybe like some kind of gray mixed in yeah. with it. I mean, yeah. I know it's not their color per se. And Tenora has a black uniform and, but I'd like to see maybe some gray thrown mm-hmm. in there. It would that, be that pretty cool. I would be that, um, like like when Coach Fairchild played, they we had the yellow. Yeah, mm-hmm. yep. I mean, so I was say, you know, Tenora like the the, the basketball team is, almost looks like a Packers right. jersey, kind of. They're kind of coming back with the little bit of the the throwback yellow slash gold. I don't know what the color it was, but um, Coach Limestall broke those out a couple of years ago. They wear them a couple of times a game. They look pretty awesome. So a couple um, schools are kind of doing yeah, that with like, yes. Napoleon with the yep, red helmets, yes. so bringing up some yep. of these colors that, that 
our school yeah. colors, but yep. we're kind of lost. I like, like that. I'd like to see Liberty with some all orange unis. That ooh, would be pretty ooh, cool. Ooh. Yeah, I'll, we'll tell you, sure. I'll tell you what, the, watching Liberty is where I kind of got my ideas for my softball team. They, they seemed like every time we went over there, there was different colors. <laughs> yeah. They have T-shirts that they wear as part of the uniform. Then they have different uniform shirts. There's like three to four different uniform <laughs> shirts they wear, and they have different colored pants they wear. And it's always like a different combination, yeah. like Keith was saying. And, and, it's, and I think they did an, an orange on orange once, if I remember right. But they always have something different they're wearing. Yeah, I like the alternate uniform idea, Logan. That's yeah, great. I think the big thing is, too, if, if you guys are out there listening, players, send in your uniforms, too. Let's see some of those combinations. Absolutely. And we'll kind of, you know, discuss some of them and see who's really got the best of the best. It's hard for us to see. And right. we know each school's colors. But to see it in person and see a picture of what uniform combinations you have, yep. yeah, send them in to us. We'll discuss them, and maybe we'll put them up on the podcast uh, and talk great. about who's got some of the sharpest uniforms Absolutely. in Northwest Ohio. Please do. So, yeah, that'd be cool to discuss. So. Guys, last hot take here. Always kind of do one a little off topic, but sweet or salty foods at the concession stand and go. <laughs> I, I think it's a combination of a mix here. I was going to yeah. say, I mean, I, to me, I like you got to have one. You, you can't just have one or, or the other. You got to have both. Yeah. Can we get because, a trail mix? <laughs> you know, if, you have, if you have, say, peanuts or salty popcorn, then you got to get like M&Ms or Twix or something yeah. to offset it. I was just about it's to say, a, I, <laughs> I love, I always, if I'm going somewhere, I always got to get a popcorn. And if it's good popcorn, you got butter. Yep. You got some salt on it. Oh, I love I love a good popcorn. And the other thing is too, yeah, if you could mix it up with some kind of chocolate, yeah. um, that really hits the spot. So, dude, I'm telling you, that, that's there's there's our there's our thing right there. Make us say make us like a sweet and salty mix that you can sell at the concession stand, like a yep. trail mix kind of thing. With you might popcorn? be onto something, like popcorn and yeah, you might be into something there. Yeah, popcorn and M and M's. Throw some M and M's. Like some people put like <laughs> chocolate and pretzels together, which yeah. I yeah. mean, it's just, yeah. I mean, you don't think that's that good until you oh, try I love it. It's chocolate. actually really good. I like the white chocolate on pretzels. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. I don't know. My go-to at the concession stand is by far just a plain popcorn. I, I love it. Yeah. It's cheap. It's yeah. good. It's simple. And yeah. I don't know. I just I think it's good to have it. We'll, have to, we'll have to do popcorn rankings, one of these uh, hot takes, too, <laughs> because I think Miles does that. Miles Holiday does it all the time. When he goes, he always has a picture of his popcorn. Like, uh, you know, you're like you're, a Dave Portnoy right, one bite. Right. Everyone knows the rules, <laughs> yeah. but popcorn edition. So yep. <laughs> I will have to save that too. I know you can tell people are getting more excited to hear us talk about this stuff because it keeps getting brought <laughs> up and up. But uh, concession stand foods, yeah. I think yep. by the end of the year, I think we'll have to have a good discussion where we actually formally discuss some of it because I know we kind of talk bits and pieces <laughs> here and here, here and there. But uh, give us a chance to try out some more venues. And I know we had talked about a couple other things we're looking forward to coming up. So, uh, We'll have that discussion maybe in week nine or ten. Definitely. I think uh, one thing that's kind of left off, not so much as sweet or salty, but like a good protein, like uh, not just your crappy, you know, hot dog or like <laughs> the same no, old I tasteless I know, uh, I know what you're breaded chicken, about. like like something good, like a pulled pork or like the ribeye sandwich. You know what I want? Time. I want that ribeye <laughs> sandwich. <laughs> I knew <laughs> right where we were going there. with that. Something different. <laughs> That's that's a protein that's not just like and eat a good hot dog. I mean, a chili dog. Throw throw something else on there that just <laughs> makes it something special. That's not like your two dollar package of Walmart brand hot dogs that taste like you just pulled them out of the boiler. Like <laughs> you like you good. like an all beef frank or what do you like? You like a cheese dog, an Oscar Mayer cheese dog? I, I, cheese, cheese dogs, dogs good are good. I don't Dude, know. I don't know. We ate about thirty hot dogs when we went up to Cleveland. Oh, <laughs> Cleveland boy, games. Yeah. Yeah. We, oh. yeah. <laughs> That yeah, was good at the time. A couple, dog night. couple innings later, not so good. Dollar <laughs> dog night. About the yeah. next morning. But was... anyways, like if Kevin Wolf, who's the old athletic director at uh, Elmwood, is is watching or somebody knows Kevin, get these gentlemen here <laughs> a sandwich for oh crying out gosh. loud I... from Elmwood. Anybody from Elmwood, send something in. I don't remember who I was talking to. I told him the other day, I said, I would literally just drive to an Elmwood football game to get that ribeye sandwich. I said, I so remember. got to buy a ticket. <laughs> I just want to get a sandwich and leave. Or oh, two, yeah. maybe. They got those things rolling on the grill, and they got the, the steak seasoning and everything. Oh, they slap a big old ribeye on a couple pieces of bread, and oh, my gosh. I've never had anything like that before. But uh, well, you, I mean, you go to, like, Wayne Trace. We'll be there in a couple weeks. They have just a burger, you know, burgers grilling out, yeah. and you smell it Ooh, when you walk in, and absolutely. you just get hit with that nice grill yeah. smell. Or a fish fry, like something that people can actually eat. Like, for us, I mean, we're there at – Five yeah, o'clock for five games. Four thirty, <laughs> Logan. <laughs> sometimes, so like just to have a good like something we can actually eat for a meal. Some substance. Yeah, just substance. just a thought. This is really thinking outside the box. What if someone brings like a blackstone and cooks breakfast for dinner? Hey, I, that works. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some steak and eggs. 
throwing on some eggs and <laughs> some sausage, you know, maybe some making, bacon, making some burritos oh, right boy. there or some kind of sandwich with, you know a, what's with funny? an egg <laughs> patty and a sausage <laughs> patty. And you I mentioned that we do the our, our softball team does the the fifth and sixth grade football team when when they host it at Sonora we do the concession stand and I make sausage and egg burritos. Sausage, oh, do you really? Sausage egg and potato burritos. Oh, I love burritos. Dude, we sell out, burritos. We sell it every year. Oh, hundred percent. Oh, sell them out. These people just. Some people come up and they'll buy one. Let me try one. The next thing you know, they're coming back and they're buying two more. You know, <laughs> so I'm like, oh, we're selling a ton of these. The next thing you know, I'm like, hey, the roaster's empty. We're out. <laughs> so one year we had sold so many, we just started making taking the tortillas, throwing cheese in between them and sticking them in the microwave and giving them quesadillas. We were out of. I mean, we didn't have anything. <laughs> Yeah, that, that'd be a good idea. They wanted hot food. I'm like, all right, wait, we can make a case. Of, one of the girls goes, hey, we can make a case of Dia. I'm like, yeah, I guess we can. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to see someone around the area do like a do a breakfast specialty item. That's something no one's even yeah. probably even thinking about. I don't know. I, breakfast is my favorite meal of the day. I just never happen to eat it because I don't get up early enough to make me <laughs> breakfast. So unless it's grabbing a granola bar out the door or something like that. But uh, no, we'll, we'll have to definitely discuss uh, some concession stand items oh, later on. Man. So. Well, that was definitely one of probably the better, a lot of the hot takes that we've had. So, again, keep sending those in each week. I'll post on the social media platforms, and uh, we'll keep discussing them each and every week. So, thanks again uh, for BSN Sports for sponsoring that segment. We're going to take a break to hear from our sponsors. We'll be back with Week 6 Game Predictions, and we'll wrap up things after that. BSN Sports is your go-to business for purchasing uniforms, equipment, spirit wear, and anything else your athletic program needs, giving you more time to impact lives on the field. With over 1,200 sales professionals who live, work, and serve in your community, you're always just a short drive or phone call away. Be sure to give your local sales rep and Jim Garris a call for any of your athletic supply needs. Optimal Performance Fitness is your go-to gym in Northwest Ohio, providing group fitness classes, personal training, and sports performance sessions for area athletes. Located in Napoleon, Ohio, give them a call today at 419-438-7265. Batten Stevens Body Shop is your number one voted auto body shop in Northwest Ohio. We are your experts on all makes and models and are the only Chrysler, Ford, and GM certified collision repair center in the area. Located in Jewel, Ohio, give us a call today at 419-497-3111 to schedule your free estimate. Come check out the Bad and Stevens Body Shop difference. Marco's Pizza is honored to sponsor NWO Sports, serving your pizza of choice in Northwest Ohio. Defiance, Archbold, Wauseon, Delta, Brian, Napoleon, Paulding, and Montpelier. Order online at marcos.com today. Remax Realty of Defiance has represented Defiance County for nearly 40 years. Located at 1401 South Jefferson Avenue in Defiance, we have 13 agents ready and available to assist you in home buying or selling needs. You can check out all the listings at www.remax419.com or call us at 419-784-3029. Let our years of experience go to work for you. For 26 years, Burkholder Taxidermy has been Northwest Ohio's trusted full-service taxidermist. From game heads to lifelike mounts, we provide exceptional quality and craftsmanship. Preserve your memories with Burkholder Taxidermy, where experience meets excellence. Located at 19331 Buckskin Road, Defiance, Ohio. Give them a call at 419-782-9538. Fairchild Family Chiropractic aims to help families to get better together in the least invasive way possible. Dr. Fairchild focuses on the neck using the Blair Technique and Palmer Package adjusting to correct spinal misalignments. Located in Defiance, Ohio, call Dr. Fairchild today at 419-576-5070 to schedule an appointment. DeLarber Concrete and Hauling is your go-to provider for concrete and hauling needs. Flat work, pole barn floors, driveways, and patios. Hauling services for stone, mulch, and dirt. Call Josh for your free estimate at 419-576-0401. Jimenez Basketball Academy strives to create an atmosphere to cultivate basketball fundamentals in Northwest Ohio youth athletes, offering one-on-one -on -one sessions, group sessions, speed and agility training, and much more. Located in Pettisville, Ohio, call Coach Jesse today at 419-551-8105. Check out Tenora Rams Live. Live events broadcast on YouTube and post-game results, articles, schedules, and more can all be found on TenoraRams.com. Feel free to look up their Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram pages as well. Northwest Ohio Basketball hosts premier basketball tournaments for boys in grades 3 to 8 in the area. Upcoming tournaments are right around the corner. Give them a call today at 419-283-5296 or check out their website at nwobball.com. 
The Drop Zone Pizzeria is the number one voted pizza restaurant in the region. Check them out for pizza, wings, subs, and more. Located in Ayersville and Stryker, or ask them about their traveling food trailer. True Land Equipment and Salesman Lauren Brown are your go-to for John Deere equipment in Archbold, Ohio. Mowers, combat tractors, skid loaders, and more. Your sales expert on commercial turf and CCE sales. Give Lauren a call today at 419-445-1565. We're back on the NW Sports Podcast, and we are on to week six game predictions. So we're going to roll through and give our picks for each uh, game this week. First game, we have Antwerp 2-3 and three at Tenora 2-3. and three. Oh, guys, I think I only have one option. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Pulling out the Lee Corso. <laughs> See if it still fits. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, trapped off. There we oh, go. We're good. I forgot there to take one strap off. <laughs> Give me the Rams. I'm taking the Rams from here on out. Oh, I think the Rams, after that win against Fairview, um, they're just going to ride that through the rest of the season, uh, especially against the Antwerp squad that has you know, struggled a little bit. They had that loss to Hicksville last week. Uh, Give me the Rams, and I think they win big. And Antwerp's definitely struggling, struggling, a lot of injuries. Um, but they, you know what you say about a wounded animal. So just if yeah. you're if you're the boys at Tenora, don't take Antwerp lightly, just because they're missing a lot of their kids. But hey, I said a couple weeks ago, Rams will go undefeated the rest of the year. So I'm taking the Rams. They'll be seven and three by season's end. Yeah, this this year now it's it's Tenora's uh, title to lose. Really, I, mean, I think they're the, kind of the favorite, knocking Fairview off and. Everybody's going to be gunning for them. They're going to get the best from everybody, and and I don't think Tenora is so far above and beyond anybody else. You know, kind of like maybe Liberty Center is in their conference. Tenora has got to fight like crazy for every game because yep. any of these teams can knock them off their pedestal. So uh, I'm going to go with Tenora. I think they win this, but they got to be careful. Yep. Uh, Tenora for homecoming night. And Matthew had Tenora, so Tenora across the board. Next game: Ayersville 0 and 5 at Edgerton 3 and 2. Edgerton suffered that tough loss to Wayne Trace, but, uh, again, Ayersville's really been struggling here to start the season. I think Edgerton rebounds this week. Give me the Bulldogs. Dogs. Yeah, Bulldogs. Uh-oh. I hear some I'm going Ayersville. Oh, oh, whoa. <laughs> I'm going Ayersville. Last second change there. Yeah, I think, I think something happened last week with Edgerton. You know, I'm not sure what's going on. Edgerton got shut out by Wayne Trace, and never, nobody ever thought they would win. I think Ayersville gets win number one this week. Wow, Ooh, bold statement. Bold. Matthew had Edgerton. So, Tony, last second change, but he's going with Ayersville and a, against the grain of everyone else. Bold move, Cotton. We'll see if it pays <laughs> off. Yes, that's, a, that's a bold move. <laughs> Next game is going to be our NW Sports game of the week. And, again, the Apaches are involved in this one, and that's Paulding 5-0 and at Fairview 3-2. and Fairview's, unfortunately, coming off a tough loss to, to Tenora. But, again, this is an, another one of the crucial games that has been talked about in the GMC you know, this could be still. It's it, it, this game holds a lot of value for potential conference championship. Uh, Balding is still undefeated in the conference coming into this game, five and zero undefeated on the season. Fairview three and two. We know they have a high powered, potent offense. I really like the Apaches. I'm going to go Fairview. I mean, I I know that they lost against Sonora and they do struggle to run the football. But I think Coach Rakes is going to be hammering that home. You know, for sure, this whole yeah. entire week they are practicing running the football. Everyone and their brother knows they can throw the football. Yeah. You know, Coach Rakes has been trying to get a little bit more balanced. I think they get that corrected, and I think they win a huge Green Meadows uh, Conference matchup here against the Paulding Panthers. Yeah, so give me the big, Apaches. This is a big, big game. Best offense in the GMC probably against the best defense in the GMC, more than likely. Um, this would be a great game to go watch, really. It would be. Um, which is why you have it the, the game of the week. Um, this is one of those program-defining moments, I think, for Paulding. They've been building for this moment for years, and it's here on Friday night at 7 o'clock. I think Coach Minzy will have the boys ready, but I just think Fairview is too talented on offense and defense, so I am taking Fairview. I'm going to take Fairview as well. I like what they were doing last week. I'm Glad Sonora came out on top, but, man, Fairview was everything we had thought they would be. Yep. Um, so I think Fairview's going to take this one away. It's going to be a tough game. I, I think Balding's going to be able to move the ball on Fairview as well. I just don't know if they can keep up with Fairview, so I'm going Apaches. And Matthew had Fairview, so Fairview across the board. 
Next game, Archbold 3-2 and two at Evergreen 2-3. and three. No Archbolds coming off a huge win over Delta. But I think this matchup gets interesting. Evergreen is just kind of lingering, I don't know, in the dark, if you want to say. Yeah. I mean, they have a lot of potential. They only lost to Wauseon 7-3, and Wauseon's down a little bit. But uh, Evergreen's a team you can't take lightly. And we talk about how you know they continue to improve year after year and just waiting for that one win to get over the hump. And could it be this week? I don't know, but uh, I, I'm going the blue streaks. I think Archibald takes care of Evergreen, but uh, I think Evergreen keeps it close. I think it will be that week, guys, because I am taking Evergreen. I'm going to go with the blue streaks. I'm going with the streaks. Matthew had Archibald, so Keith going against the green with Evergreen, so we'll see how that pays off. Next game, Liberty Center 5-0 and at Brian 0-5. Uh, two totally different teams this year. Liberty Center's top of the league. Brian is, you know, sitting towards the bottom. I think Liberty Center goes into Brian, takes care of business, and, uh, you know, another running clock early in third quarter. This game, I think, gets ugly quick. Yep. Boy, Tigers all the way. Oh, yeah, I don't think there's even a question. Liberty Center. <sighs> Liberty Center. <laughs> 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 Matthew at Liberty Center. You're really contemplating that one. <laughs> Liberty Center for all uh, of us. Next game, Swan 0 and 5 at Delta 4 and 1. Again, it's tough to win at Delta, and Delta had a lot of home games to start the season, but again, uh, no track field. That's a good, always a yeah. good environment. So I'm taking the Panthers. Give me Delta. Panthers. Oh, uh, yeah, Panthers. Delta for me. And Matthew had Delta. Next game, Wasion 2 and 3 at Patrick Henry 4 and 1. Uh, Patrick Henry, we really haven't heard much of him lately. They've just kind of been taking care of business ever since they had that loss to Columbus Grove. And uh, Coach Enselman, uh, congratulations to him. He's now the all-time leader for NWL wins. That's something we wanted to bring up as well. Yep. So another uh, icon for, and coaching legend in Northwest Ohio. So congratulations to him and the Patriots. But uh, with that being said, I'm going Patrick Henry. I think they've got things figured out. And, again, they're just kind of rolling. they got a lot of really, really good athletes on that team. So give me the Patriots. Patriots for me. Patriots. Patriots. Matthew had Patrick Henry. So Patrick Henry from all of us. Next game, Kenton 1-4 and four at Defiance 3-2. and two, And uh, I think this one's going to go to the Bulldogs easily. Defiance is one of the hottest teams right now. They've really found their groove. Give me the Bulldogs by three-plus scores. Hey, like we said earlier, uh, a couple, I guess early as a couple weeks ago, but uh, one play basically turned around the Defiance yeah. season that yeah, seemed. Yeah, it did. Um, take the dogs. Yeah, Bulldogs. Bulldogs for me. And Matthew had defiance. Next game, Ottawa Glandorf, two and three at Lima Bath, four and one. I kind of had to think about this game a little bit. Ottawa Glandorf has, has much improved this season and have been in in a lot of games, very competitive. But with Lima Bath being four and one, I think they just they've got a little bit too much going for them. I'm taking Lima Bath. I actually originally had OG. Then I switched it to Bath. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go with Lima Bath. I'm going Bath at home. And Matthew had Lima Bath. Next game, St. Mary's 3-2 and two at Van Wert 1-4. and four. Uh, I'm taking St. Mary's. I think that, again, they're one of the top teams in the WBL. Van Wert still, I feel like, struggling to find their identity a little bit. Yep. Uh, they're kind of hanging around 1-4, uh, and four, just kind of off to a rough start. And uh, give me St. Mary's. St. Mary's for me. I'm going to go with St. Mary's here. St. Mary's. And Matthew had St. Mary's. Next game, Napoleon 3-2 and two at Fremont Ross 1-4. and four. And I th- believe when we talked about Napoleon last week, we were talking about how they would finish out the season. And I truly do. I think that they have a really good shot to win out the rest of their ball games. For, I Like I said, Fremont Ross, I wasn't sure of how they were, but we see they're 1-4, and four, struggling a little bit. Uh, give me Napoleon. I think the Wildcats take this one easily. Cats. Uh, Wildcats from Napoleon. Napoleon. And Matthew had Napoleon. Next game, Columbus Grove 5-0 and at Allen East 3-2. and Not even a question. Give me the Bulldogs right off the bat. Dogs. Hell yeah, Bulldogs for sure. Columbus Grove. Matthew had Columbus Grove. Next game, Lipsick 3-2 and at Riverdale 2-3. and uh, I really like the Vikings in this one. Lipsick is finding a nice groove here, 3-2 and on the season. I think they're starting to figure some things out, controlling the ball a little bit better, so give me Lipsick. Vikings for me, too. Lipsick. Lipstick for me. And Matthew had lipstick. A couple more 11 man games. Eden, 5 0 at Montpelier, 1 4. Uh, Montpelier's just kind of struggled a little bit this year. 
But Eden is firing on all cylinders. I think Eden goes into Montpelier, and uh, I think they take this game big. I think Eden's just going to light up the scoreboard. Give me the Bombers. Bombers. Uh, yeah, Eden's going to take this one big. Eden for me. And Matthew had Eden. Last 11-man game, uh, pretty interesting matchup, too. North Central 1-4 and four at Van Lu 0-5. Oh and, and a fun fact I brought up to these guys, I saw a kid from Van Lu actually broke the state record for most – Blocked punts yeah. in a game with four, so and they still lost. <laughs> so, uh, give me North Central. Uh, I think I, that I think North Central is gonna ride last week's win into another win this week. So, give me the Eagles. Uh, this is a coin flip game for me. It came up Van Lu. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go with North Central on this one, but man, I could go either way. Go with the Eagles. And Matthew had North Central. A couple eight man games on the slate. Uh, Fremont. I don't know, what is it? Fremont St. Joe Catholic, Central Catholic. I think that's what Probably. SJCC stands for. <laughs> One and three at Holgate, three and oh. Uh, Holgate is taking care of business in eight, man. I think Holgate wins this one by four plus scores. Tigers. Oh, bold uh, statement there. Uh, I'm going to go with Holgate. Holgate. And Matthew had Holgate. Last eight man game, Toledo Christian, four and oh at Striker, one and three. And Keith and I got to watch Toledo Christian in person last year. And Carter Kester's tearing things up, and that – I mean, geez, they have enough to field an 11-man team. I believe they have, what, probably oh, 30 like kids? 35, 35 35 kids. kids. <laughs> They're pretty talented, too. I mean, they would they would honestly compete with a lot of the 11-man schools around yep. here. Uh, but give me Toledo Christian. I think that they – again, they have a really good shot at repeating this year, I think. Uh, TC. I'm just sticking with the local teams. I know it might be pretty lopsided, but I'm still going to hold out for striker. So, you know, pull, pull through for me, striker. Toledo Christian. And Matthew had Toledo Christian. So, guys, that is going to conclude the podcast. Closing thoughts. It's going to be an exciting week. A couple of big games, like you mentioned, Fairview, Fairview Pauline, um, it's going to be a big game. You know, Hicksville Wayne Trace game is going to be a big one too. I think it's going to be an interesting game to watch. Just uh, hopefully the weather is not too crappy right now. I know Keith was saying what fifty percent chance. Yeah, the possible? remnants of the hurricane they said should be around Northwest Ohio on Jeez, Friday morning. Could you imagine, morning if, could you the imagine if that develops though? Like, uh, what if we get some massive? It's like storm. It could four. definitely it could torrential de- downpours. Yeah, it definitely, yeah. in you know. It, impact some of these games if you get oh, bad winds, Strong bad, winds, you know, rain. You're not going to throw the ball. You're going to rely on the – I mean, use Fairview, for example. They couldn't run the ball against us um, last week. But, you know, if they can't throw the ball and they have to resort to a running game against Baldwin because it's so bad outside. Wind's blowing 30 miles you know, an hour. I mean, that that totally flips the, flips the script big time Definitely. against Paulding, so <clears throat> or against Fairview. Yep. Now, for me, it's just like congratulations getting to Coach I, 177 conference wins. I mean, some coaches don't even coach 177 games in their right. career. Like, he just had a fantastic uh, career. Um, so, congratulations to Coach I. And I want to give a shout-out to Crescent News. And Shane uh, Neeson does a great job. But he wrote an article yeah. on – well, he published it sat Sunday, I think. But it came out in um, Tuesday's paper. But he had a little article about – it was about the Rams' win over Fairview. But it was more or less about – the entire setting Friday night of high school football. So if you get a chance, check that out. Shane did a really good job just about the whole environment and everything from start to finish involving that game is what high school football, which we talk about all the time. Mm -hmm. This is what high school football should be about is what Shane described in this article. So shout out, get a chance, check out that article that Shane wrote. Absolutely. Uh, You know, we're halfway through the season already for most teams. They've only got five weeks left. You know, a few others might have a little farther, but time's <laughs> dwindling down for some of these senior classes. So yeah. make the most of what you got, keep at it, and, and love what you do because it comes up quick. I mean, I'm getting excited. I know we we're, mm-hmm. were already discussing, you know, possibly going down to Canton to watch the <laughs> watch the state games, or you know, hopefully some local teams make it. And I'm just excited. Yeah. And another week, and it just again, it's cliche, but we you always say that, you know the season runs by. So mm-hmm. quick, and it really does. It's just like the other day we were at the kickoff show. Now we're week six, and soon you're going to blink, and it's already round one of playoffs. Yeah. So mm-hmm. uh, I'm excited. A lot of good teams are and games are on the slate for this week, and a lot of 
teams that really need to win um, that in order to compete for that conference title or, you know, playoff berth. So uh, we're going to see a lot of good games this Friday. And again, like we always say, get out and support your, your school, your community and all that. And like we had talked about too on Friday night, that was literally picture perfect of what Northwest Ohio football is all about. You're getting a big crowd. Everyone's coming out, you know, you get the bitty cheerleaders involved and teachers getting dumped with water and <laughs> oh yeah Fun i will say i was, yeah. was kind of disappointed in that because everyone i everyone was saying they don't have an actual dunk tank i was picturing like a big dunk tank filled with water and that they were going to fall into i guess it was a five gallon bucket that dumped on top of their head so i said well maybe we'll we'll have to see if we from, can get from something. what i've read from uh coach thiel and a couple other ones that got dunked on. They said it was actually kind of chilly. Oh, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> Put some that, ice in that bucket. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, that's cool. And, and standing room only. And I just hope that these crowds continue to come out and, you know, go out and support your teams. It means yeah. a lot. And there's just nothing like high school football in Northwest Ohio. There really isn't. There isn't. So. The, the more people you get there, the better the atmosphere gets, too. So even the people that are already there will appreciate having more people because it – you can feel the energy in the stadium Absolutely. when you have more people. It just resonates around and, and really gets the fans into it, but the players feel the energy. It makes the whole experience for everybody involved so much better. Mm-hmm. Which AJ talked about, I think, last week, and we've talked about a couple times throughout the, the season. Grab your lawn chair, grab your family, and just go set in the end zone. I mean, <laughs> we've noticed a lot of that this year especially. Teams and fans just filling up the end zone, I guess on the outside of the field, obviously, with – Lawn chairs and are just sitting there watching the game. Well, I mean, it's great. Wait a minute, guys. Didn't Tenora used to have like an old couch that they were like yeah, ra- raffling yeah. off stuff, like yep. tickets to go sit on the uh, field? Fairview, or not Fairview, Ayersville used to as well. I don't know if they still do. I think do, teams but, should bring that back. Yeah. Or, or not only, you know, if you want to raffle <laughs> off stuff to make a little bit of money for the school or whatever, but you know, start letting people kind of line those end zones up. Like Archbold, I know, has yeah. bleachers in yep. the end zone. It's just additional seating. Liberty Center lets people with camp chairs. Yep. And their stadium set up a little bit different, yep. and they don't have a track, but... I say, you know, let people sit down there in the end zone. I, I, I don't know. I like it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. Well, that's going to conclude things from us. We want to thank all of our sponsors, BSN Sports, Optimal Performance Fitness, Marco's Pizza, Remax Realty of Defiance, Bat and Stevens Body Shop, Burkholder Taxidermy, Delarbor Concrete and Hauling, Fairchild Family Chiropractic, Drop Zone Pizzeria, Tenor Rams Live, Jim and his Basketball Academy, NWO Basketball, Trueland Equipment, and Lauren Brown, We'd also like to give a special thanks to Jeff Bat for allowing us to use his amazing facility at Bat Stevens Body Shop for today's podcast. Stay tuned for the next NWO Sports podcast in the near future, and thanks for watching. Watch out for the new podcast logo as well, so check that out. Thanks, guys.